the water only thing. The, the promise called for no wine. Anything. Yeah. Right. Water only. Is it pause now? Try to see. Slides. I think it's paused now. I wanted to pause it on this until we get started. So then, um, uh, yes, I agree. Yeah. She said yes. Oh, I just, oh, who, Martha? Oh. I think when you're talking into the mic, you're going to Okay, great. I don't know. Jana, would you like me to advance the slides for you? Yeah. As you're talking? Okay. Did you guys get that? I'm just going to use my finger. We're ready. Hello. Hey. Hi, everybody. Welcome to ReFest, our first seminar for kicking it all off. Uh, really happy all you fish geeks are he here. I see lots of familiar faces. It's hard to see everybody behind their mask, but that's the times we're in, right? Name tags are great if you haven't gotten a name tag yet and you have time in between seminars, definitely go out and grab a name tag. That helps a lot. Uh, just a couple of things. First off, if you don't know where the restrooms are located, out this door, across the big hallway, look for a gigantic sign above a doorway that says restrooms. And that'll take you there. Um, we do have masks required all the time inside, except for me, of course, right here. Um, and uh, really critical, the only thing that is allowed in here as far as food and drink goes is water. So that means no coffee cups with any other liquids in them. So if you have that, you're going to need to go out and deposit it somewhere. So water's fine in here. All right, so um, just a couple of announcements to get started. We have the schedule for today. After this, we have a, uh, we have a fish ID workshop, then a lionfish workshop after that. After that, you are all totally invited to come to um, the Reef Campus at 5 p.m. for our open house. And there will be a open bar, light snacks, Five to seven o'clock tonight, drop in at any point. It'd be great to see all of you. Fun to meet everybody. Uh, and then tomorrow night, there's a social uh, at here at 4.30 to 6. Everyone also is welcome. And then Saturday night is the Love of the Sea for the Love of the Sea Banquet. Um, if you don't have a ticket for that yet and you want one, you can still get one. There's a few available. So you can go to out to that welcome station and they'll be able to help you uh, get a ticket for that. 
Uh, we're going to have lots of items for a silent raffle. That'll be at all of the different places. You'll be able to take a look at those and browse through. Uh, who's going diving or kayaking or anything? Raise your hand tomorrow. Oh, good. I might see some of you on a boat tomorrow or the next day. So uh, be sure you check in at your appropriate place you're going to at 8 a.m., okay? Who's, just curiosity, who's going on the Keys Dive boat? I'll see you guys there. Okay. Um, let's see. Big thanks to all of the Eco Excursion hosts, especially to the Government Center, to Leo over here. See this guy? I want everybody to clap for him over there. Yay, Leo. And above you, which you can't really see unless you're close here, is a young man named David up there who's going to lean out and wave. He is our AV guy, as is Daryl, wherever Daryl went. Um, don't, <laughs> he's missing in action. So anyway, they all have been such a big help. David has a company called Fantastic Endeavors. So if you ever have any um, need, we are so grateful to him for helping out with the AV and for Leo and all that, those who have helped out. I totally forgot our live audience. Yay. All right. We are live on YouTube now. Ah, there's Daryl. Excellent. Thank you, Daryl. Everybody wave to Daryl. <laughs> okay, so now, without any further ado, we're going to get into what we're all excited about, which is what? Fish. So, Stacy, yeah. that's not a fish. Um, Stacy and Amy are going to be leading us in a fish ID presentation. So, whether you're a beginner or experienced and reviewing, um, we should all enjoy it. So, take it away, guys. Thanks, everyone, for being here. All right, thank you, Jana. And thank you all for uh, joining us at ReFest 2021. We're all really excited to be here. This is our first event, so we've got an exciting weekend in store. Um, as Jana said, we are going to discuss Florida Keys fish identification tonight. So let's go ahead and get started. Okay, <laughs> kicking it off, um, before we identify the fish, we want you guys to be able to identify us. Um, so we're going to introduce ourselves. Uh, I'll let my colleague Stacy introduce himself first. All right, let's see. Okay, perfect. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Stacy Henderson. I'm the program services coordinator at Reef, uh, and my favorite fish is the bearded toadfish. And it's, it's a very unique fish. I wouldn't say it's everyone's favorite fish. Um, there's a little bit of a story to it. Um, when I first started my dive career, um, I did it in the Bay Islands of Honduras where this fish is found. Um, and it makes kind of like a, a certain noise and it does it quite often. And throughout all of my dives there, I would hear it, but I would never see it. And I would hear uh, guests would come back and say, oh, I saw the toad fish and I never saw it. Um, and after a very long time being there, I finally found this fish. So before I even found out about reef, this was the first fish on my kind of fish to find list. Um, so that, that's got a kind of special place in my heart. Okay, and my name is Amy Lee. I am the engagement and communications manager at Reef. And my favorite fish, unbiased opinion, it's a lot prettier than Stacy's favorite fish. It is the peppermint basslet. And these guys are found throughout the tropical Western Atlantic region. Um, they're in the sea bass family, which you can tell by their pupil, which is shaped like a watermelon seed. Um, and they like to live deep inside uh, caves, crevices, and recesses. So um, I'm one of those crazy people that goes on every dive with a flashlight so that I can try and find this fish. Uh, they're only a couple inches long, but they're, as you can see, very vibrantly colored and one of my favorite fish to see. And you can see them in the Florida Keys. So for anybody going diving tomorrow, maybe you'll notice one. All right, before we jump into the fish that we're gonna cover tonight, I keep saying tonight, it is the afternoon. It's a little, a little dark in here, but uh, before we jump into the fish we cover this afternoon, um, we wanna tell you guys about why we're doing this. Why do we even want to be able to identify fish? Um, well, Reef's cornerstone program is called the Volunteer Fish Survey Project. It's a citizen science program that engages volunteer divers and snorkelers to collect and report data on marine fishes as well as sea turtles and in some locations, temperate waters, uh, invertebrates and algae. We only uh, collect fish and sea turtle data here in the tropical Western Atlantic. 
Uh, but our vol the Volunteer Fish Survey Project contains the world's largest database of marine life sightings, more than 250,000 surveys and over a million marine life records uh, currently. And these data are really important because they are being used to better understand and protect ocean habitats all over the world. The database is publicly accessible, so any of you can get online and view it as well. And we also have plenty of educational resources to help you learn your fish. So if anyone here is interested in getting started or anybody listening online is interested in getting started, um, or if you have any questions at all, please come talk to Stacy, me, or any other reef staff or intern this weekend, and we'd be happy to tell you a little bit more. So as I mentioned before, the Volunteer Fish Survey Project is conducted worldwide. We have 11 survey regions. I'm gonna jump back to the previous slide here. So all of these areas where you see color, those are different regions that correspond to different um, educational materials and um, different fish that we survey. Um, right now we're focusing on the tropical Western Atlantic, specifically the Florida Keys. We're gonna talk about those fish today. Volunteers have been collecting data in the tropical Western Atlantic survey region since 1993, so um, almost 30 years now. And there are currently 175,000 surveys just from the tropical Western Atlantic region alone in the reef database. And there have been more than 900 species reported. So we are not gonna cover that many fish today. We're gonna cover about 25 to 30. So we'll scratch the surface and it'll be a good um, way for beginners to learn as well as a good refresher for those of you who know your fish pretty well already. So when you're thinking about identifying fish, there are a few good things to be aware of. One of them is the different fins that a fish have because when you look at certain fins, there can be markings or fin shapes that can help you determine what type of fish you're looking at. So here we have a helpful diagram. Um, fin number one running along the back is the fish's dorsal fin. The second fin, number two, is the tail fin. The technical name for that is caudal. Um, the area that connects the tail to the body is called a caudal peduncle, but you can also say tail base. Um, fin number three is the anal fin. Um, the fin kind of on the fish's belly is the ventral or pelvic fin, number four. Um, the pectoral fin is fin number five. And then in addition to being aware of the fins, there are some good markings to kind of note. When we talk about bars, those are gonna be vertical, just straight up and down markings, whereas stripes are horizontal. So if you think of um, like a pair of striped pajamas, perhaps. Um, bands are diagonal markings. So um, if you think of holding a guitar, like you're playing a guitar, you're in a band, I can help you remember that bands run diagonally. In addition to that, um, some fish can have line markings kind of radiating from the eye, almost like a sunburst. That's a good thing to be aware of and watch out for. Um, they may also have a spot that has a ring around it. We call that an acellus or a false eye spot. Um, they may also just have a well-defined circular marking. You can just call that a spot. Um, they might have a smattering of fine spots, which we say are speckles. And then uh, a blotch is more of a poorly defined marking or uh, something that has a bit of an irregular border. Oh, and lines, I think lines are self-explanatory. We all know what lines are. Okay, so now we're actually gonna jump into our fish. Um, first fish, this is kind of an iconic species of the Florida Keys. If um, any of you come to our events uh, later this weekend or in the evening, you will actually uh, receive a bag provided by the Tourist Development Council with this fish on it. It's the queen angelfish. Um, angelfish are very graceful. They move almost like a flowy, in a flowy way, like they're wearing an angel's gown. Um, so their name is very descriptive of the way that they look. The queen in particular, um, I'm gonna give this laser pointer a shot here. Let's see if it works. Ooh, it does. Um, the queen has this um, brilliant blue marking with a bunch of blue spots um, up right on their forehead here. So we say that the queen wears a crown and that's a good way to remember that you're looking at a queen angel fish. Um, these fish can get to be about 18 inches long. So you're definitely gonna notice them if you're diving or snorkeling out on the reef. As you can see, they're very vibrantly colored, um, beautiful mix of yellow, green, and bright blue, uh, kind of ringing the entire body. They have um, these fins that flow and taper to a point here. 
um, which is char characteristic of many angelfish. They do have these um, kind of trailing filaments on their top and bottom fins. Um, the queen in particular is gonna have a bright, all yellow, bright yellow tail fin. Um, another key characteristic of angelfish, which this photo shows really well, is this sharp spine here. Uh, we call this an opercular spine um, because it's located on the fish's gill cover, which the term for that is an operculum, but you can also call this a cheek spine. Um, and all angelfish possess this. So that's a good way to know if you're looking at an angelfish or perhaps another brightly colored fish in a different family. So this is our queen angelfish. I think we have one more, another good shot here. And this picture was actually taken by Daryl Duda, who's helping us out with the AV system today. Uh, oh, and this is a good time for us to say thank you to all of the photographers who have uh, generously allowed us to use their stunning photography for educational materials. So thanks to Daryl and anybody else who has let us use photos for our presentations. Um, again, so queen wears the crown. All right, our next angelfish is the rock beauty. Um, this one is a little bit smaller in size. They grow to be about a foot long, um, can definitely also be smaller. They're very brightly colored. You'll notice with a lot of angelfish, one of their key characteristics is they're kind of a flattened oval shape and they typically possess really bright, uh, bright body coloration or bright markings. These ones are bright yellow with uh, this kind of disruptive color pattern here, this big black uh, blotch, which is actually just designed to um, sort of be a confusing or disorienting thing for predators to see. Um, so that's definitely helpful for them, but angelfish in general are not usually preyed upon too much because they, uh, one of their main food sources is sponges, and apparently that makes them taste pretty unpalatable. So if you eat sponges, you do not taste good to other fish. So yeah, rock beauty. We'll take one more, look at one more photo here. This one um, I believe is a little bit younger of a rock beauty because when they are um, fully grown, they have this dark area on their mouth, um, which is often bright blue. Um, but this guy doesn't quite have that. He is kind of just starting to develop that. So I think this is a bit younger of one. And as you can see, he also hasn't fully developed that back area at the back either. Okay, next angelfish we're gonna look at is the French angelfish. This one is pretty large, can grow to about 18 or 19 inches in length. And these guys are what we like to call uh, like dinner plate size because you know they're, they're very circular, like a big dinner plate that you'd set the table with. Again, they do have the trailing filament on the dorsal as well as the anal fin. But the key thing about the French angelfish is this all dark body, and then they have yellow on the scale tips. And a way that I like to remember this is French's mustard is yellow. So if you see the yellow um, scale tips on the dark body, you're looking at a French angelfish. And as you can see, they also have a little bit of yellow on the pectoral fin, a yellow ring around the eye, and then a yellow tip on um, that filament on their dorsal fin. So here's another shot of the French angelfish. You may often see these guys in pairs as well. Okay, another angelfish that looks kind of similar to the French. There are some key differences, which I'll point out, um, but similar in shape and size is the gray angelfish. Again, dinner plate sized, um, kind of a dark body color, but um, it's more of a gray, whereas the French is really that dark uniform black. The gray angelfish also has a squared off or straight tail margin, whereas I'm actually gonna jump back a photo or two. The French, if you look closely, his tail margin is not a straight line, it's rounded. So that is kind of one of those little nuances that you need to get a good look at, but it is something that differentiates the two. So we'll go back to our gray. Um, again, in pairs, often seen like the French, um, the gray lacks any sort of really bright color on those scale centers. Um, instead, I think that this pattern looks like gray cobblestone streets. Um, so that helps me remember the gray angelfish. And then this next photo here, as you can see, 
the inner part of their pectoral fin is bright yellow. So rather than just a little bit of yellow at the pectoral fin base, like the French angelfish, the gray is gonna have this really, really vivid yellow coloration. So when you're underwater, if you see them moving their pectoral fins, you'll be able to get a good glance at that flash of yellow. Okay, so we're gonna shift into a different family now and talk about butterfly fish. Um, these ones are also very vibrantly colored, um, very noticeable out and about on the reef. Um, you'll definitely see these uh, along with the angelfish. They're not a fish you need a magnifying glass for. You don't really have to go out of your way to hunt for them. Um, they're very noticeable. So uh, this is the banded butterfly fish. Um, many butterfly fish uh, come in shades of yellow, black, or white, or some combination of those colors. So as you can see here, uh, the banded has a white body with these uh, black, well, I told you guys earlier that bands are diagonal and here we have um, pretty straight up and down lines. So I would actually call these bars, um, but anyone who has studied fish ID knows that oftentimes the names don't necessarily, we like when a name matches up with what the fish looks like, but that doesn't always happen. Um, so. That's okay, we don't make the rules, we just follow them. Um, this, so this is the banded, just a uh, white body with black stripes. Um, another thing that a lot of butterfly fish have uh, as a characteristic is a stripe that runs through the eye and it's just designed to camouflage. So this one displays that really well. And similar to some species of angelfish, butterfly fish can also uh, often be seen in pairs. That's typically how you're gonna find them. So. Uh, this picture kind of just shows that. We've got two banded butterfly fish uh, hanging out with a bit of soft coral here. And these guys are not quite as large as most of the angelfish. These uh, can grow to be about six inches in length. Okay, so our next species we're gonna look at is the four-eye butterfly fish. Again, not very large, about six inches when they're fully grown. They're called four-eye because um, they have two <laughs> real eyes, obviously one on each side. Um, and then they have this false eye back here, which if you think back a couple slides, we discussed that this is um, an oscillated spot or an ocellus, so a fake eye, false eye. Um, so that's uh, kind of a protective coloration for them. Again, just design, designed to um, confuse predators, kind of throw them off. Um, these guys are kind of a pale buttery yellow color and um, they get a little bit more bright towards the uh, outer margin of the body. They do have a faint uh, dark stripe running through the eye. This can um, be darker or it can be more faint like this. So it's not always really, really noticeable or vivid. Um, really what you wanna look for here to identify the four-eye butterfly fish is the, the uh, ocellus on their back. And here's a good side view shot of the four-eye butterfly fish. Okay, next one we're gonna look at, another common Florida Keys butterfly fish. This is the spot fin. They have a uh, bright pearly white body, again, with the band, very distinct band running through the eye. Um, yellow kind of rimming all of their outer fins and around, running around the body. But the reason they're named spot fin is because of this black dot here, um, kind of at the tip of their dorsal fin. So that is the spot that we are referring to on the spot fin butterfly fish. And like other butterfly fish, you'll often see this one in pairs as well. This one can get a little bit larger than the four eye and the banded. They grow to about eight inches in length. Okay, next family we're gonna talk about is the surgeon fish family. You may often see surgeon fish in large schools in addition to um, smaller groupings or even individually. And we have three species of surgeon fish in the tropical Western Atlantic. You may also see them in mixed schools as well. So it won't all just be one species a lot of the time. You may see several of the species. We're gonna talk about all three species today. Um, one of the characteristics of surgeon fish that it's good to be aware of is this little spine on the caudal peduncle or tail base. And this spine is a very, very sharp spine. We actually refer to it as a scalpel um, and that kind of helps you remember the surgeon fish has a spine that's as sharp as a surgeon's scalpel. 
So all surgeon fish uh, kind of have this oval-shaped body, and they also tend to be brightly colored, but their coloration can vary a little bit. They can be paler or light, uh, lighter or darker, depending on the uh, species or the time of day. So this is the blue tang. Uh, fully grown, it can be about 15 inches long. The blue tang is um, a bright, vivid blue color. Again, like I said, they can be a little bit paler um, depending on if they're in a big school hunting or if they're resting, um, but generally gonna be blue with a bright yellow or white scalpel, and it really stands out underwater. So that's the key feature that you wanna be looking for is the scalpel that is um, a very distinct light color. Whereas the next surgeon fish we're looking at, the ocean surgeon fish, his scalpel is dark, um, either uh, brown, black, or blue. And it's never gonna be white or yellow. Uh, the ocean surgeon fish is about the same size, fully grown as the blue tang, 15 inches. Um, this is one that can vary quite a bit in coloration. This one here uh, is kind of like a pale green gray almost. Whereas this same species, another ocean surgeon fish, is uh, kind of a dark brown with a little bit of blue. So the coloration can vary significantly. What you really want to look for for this one, in addition to that dark scalpel, is the pectoral fins. So notice that their pectoral fins are clear. You can really see through them. Sometimes you kind of have to get behind them. Uh, like the angle of this photo and wait for them to move their pec fins. But you'll notice that the um, fin margin here is, uh, it's clear. So we say the ocean surgeon fish, the pectoral fins are clear like the ocean. So just another quick glance at this one. Again, clear pectoral fins. Okay, our last surgeon fish, this is the doctor fish also in the surgeon fish family. These ones are uh, fully grown, the largest of the three surgeon fish. They can grow to um, about 16 or 17 inches in length. And they are also uh, very variable in color, in body color. So typically a dark blue can also be a light blue or more of a brown, like we saw with the ocean surgeon fish. And they can be a little bit tricky because their scalpel is the same color. So it's, it's a blue, it's kind of a darker scalpel. Um, again, sort of blends into the body. But the thing that sets these guys apart is their um, bars that run straight up and down on the body. But uh, fish are tricky and they can kind of turn these bars on and off. So they're not always going to be this vivid underwater. Um, so make sure that, you know, when you're seeing a big school of surgeon fish, um, look at them closely and see if maybe the bars are there, but they're not quite as vivid as this image that we're looking at. Sometimes they will be, um, you know, a little bit lighter. So that's another reason why it's good to have a flashlight with you because you can kind of shine it. And especially if you're a little bit deeper in the water and see if, you know, maybe it really does have bars and uh, just needed a little bit more light on it. But again, blue body with uh, that blue or dark scalpel is key for the doctor fish. Okay, um, I've got one more family I'm gonna talk through with you guys and then I'm actually gonna hand it off to Stacy for the second half. Uh, we're gonna finish out the first half of the presentation with damselfish. Um, so damselfish as a family, uh, there's quite a few species. Um, some of them can be quite tricky uh, to differentiate between, but we're gonna look at some of the most commonly seen ones in the Florida Keys today, including the bicolor damselfish. It is not super large, grows to about four to five inches in length. And of course, um, I mentioned earlier, fish names can be a little bit misleading because by color would think, you'd think there's two colors, but obviously this fish has three colors on it. Um, so this is a pretty, pretty typical textbook by color damselfish coloration. So um, dark on the front half of the body, kind of tapering onto the dorsal fin, uh, they can have yellow uh, on the belly or uh, pelvic and ventral fin area. And then towards the back, they start to uh, display um, just less color. Um, back half of the body is white. Um, they may sometimes, um, depending on where you're diving, 
Um, they may only appear black and white. They don't always have this much yellow. So that's a good thing to be aware of. But this one here um, obviously has lots of yellow. And these guys will typically live in groups. Um, they're very territorial. So if you get close, they will actually um, look you right in the eye and you kind of be like, what are you doing? Get out of my algae garden. Um, because they uh, will actually maintain um, these little gardens of algae and that's kind of their territory. So another bicolor damselfish, this one has way less yellow than that first photo we were looking at. So he, this um, individual is more uh, black and white. All right, our next damselfish is the three spot damsel. And I frequently, as this picture shows, uh, I frequently see this fish living among staghorn coral. Uh, they actually like to eat the coral polyps. Um, these ones here, they can be um, kind of a dark tan to a golden or light yellow color. Um, this is a, an adult, so fully grown. They look a little bit different as a juvenile. We do have a photo of that on the next slide. As an adult, um, you'll notice that their scale margins are a little bit pale, um, and they also have this yellow eyelid here as well as a black spot at the base of the pectoral fin. And again, there's one on the other side as well. Um, and if you look closely, you can see here on the tail base, um, there's a dark area here as well. That's not always present, but they can display this dark saddle-like spot. This is just another color variation of the three spot damsel. This one uh, has a bit more yellow and uh, less of that tan going on. Uh, again, yellow on the eyelid, um, dark spot on the pectoral fin base, and then I believe there's, we see the dark spot on the tail base. When they're younger, this is what they look like. They are bright yellow. Um, the dark spot is present on the tail base, and they also have a dark spot um, on the body that spills over onto the dorsal fin. And this is not present throughout their whole lives. They will eventually lose this spot as they get older. You can kind of see here, I think there's a bit of a remnant of it, um, so as they get older, they no longer have that spot on their back. Okay, next fish. This one is um, very beautiful and eye-catching. Um, they're typically seen in very, very coral-rich areas. They love fire coral. This is the yellow-tailed damselfish. And they kind of look like a disco ball. Um, they've got a uh, navy blue dark body with these brilliant blue spots just um, kind of covering the whole entire body. Um, as they get older, the spots will start to fade towards the mid body and they'll be concentrated more just along the back area. But obviously they get their name from this bright yellow tail here and their tail color actually develops with age. So when they're a little bit younger, they look like this down here. And I know the uh, background color is a little bit confusing, but this uh, tail is actually clear. So as they get older, their tail color develops into this bright yellow. Um, so when they're young, they're uh, just a bright blue, cute little disco ball living among their fire coral. And then as they get older, they um, sort of lose the spots covering their whole body. Again, they are a bit more concentrated along the back and their body color tends to fade as well. So this one is probably um, starting to get a little bit older um, and has the bright yellow tail. This is also one of the larger damselfish species that can grow to be almost eight inches in length. Okay, so a few more damselfish. This one behaves a little bit differently than other damselfish we've discussed, which are um, really living down amongst the coral, not actively swimming too much. This one, the Sergeant Major, is um, commonly seen swimming in the water above a structure, um, kind of up in what we call the water column, just swimming around constantly because they are plankton pickers. So they eat um, little, uh, little plankton that is actually floating around in the water. And it's called the Sergeant Major because they have these um, vertical bars on their body like on a sergeant's uniform. And they can be um, a silvery blue color with um, this yellow or greenish wash running along the back. The key here is uh, really going to be these uh, dark vertical bars. 
Something that the sergeant majors do is they actually guard. This is a, this stuff that looks like grape jelly here is a bunch of sergeant major eggs. So um, they will actually guard their egg patches. So they lay their eggs um, down in the sand or on a reef structure, and then they will come down and kind of hover over their egg patch and guard them. And when they're guarding their eggs, they turn really, really dark like this. And it's actually quite interesting to see because if you see these, um, I call them grape jelly smears on the reef. Um, take a look and see if you'll notice one of these guarding because they, they guard them ferociously and they will chase other fish off of them. Um, and sometimes you can see other fish trying to sneak to the perimeter and take a nibble on the Sergeant Major eggs. Okay, so next damselfish we're gonna discuss is the blue chromis. Chromis are a subfamily of damselfish and chromis behave a little bit differently. So um, I mentioned earlier in the presentation that you can look at the shape of a fish's tail to um, determine a little bit about its lifestyle. And this is a good example of that because um, the blue chromis, along with the next fish we're gonna talk about, has a very deeply forked tail. And normally if you see a fish with a deep fork in its tail, it means that it's constantly swimming. Um, often fish that are very pelagic have a forked tail. Um, this fish lives on the reef, but they live up in the water column as well, and they're constantly moving around. These ones eat plankton, um, like the Sergeant Major that we just looked at. Um, they also have a very uh, kind of tapered body shape, so that kind of helps them out with their constant swimming also. The blue chromis is um, kind of a uniform, brilliant blue color. They do have this dark area running along the back, um, and then dark margins on the top and bottom lobes of the tail fin. One way that you're gonna see these quite often is um, in schools. So like I said, swimming, active swimmers up above the reef, um, they may also mix in with other fish. Um, I do wanna point out that this fish right here is not a blue chromis. Um, this is a Creole wrasse. Um, so don't let that one confuse you if it looks a little bit different. Um, the ones that are blue chromis are pretty much all of these here, but this is commonly how you're gonna notice these. All right, another chromis is the brown chromis, also very common. The brown chromis has um, some more detailed or unique body coloring than the blue chromis, which is kind of just that uniform blue. Um, the brown chromis is kind of a light tan to uh, brown color, fit, often fading um, when as you get further down the fish. Uh, they have a white spot right at the base of the back of the dorsal fin here. Um, again, their tail is deeply forked because they behave like the blue chromis. They're constantly swimming. They're up in the water column picking plankton. Um, but notice the tail tips have um, the top and bottom have um, a bright yellow. It's almost like they were dipped in yellow. And then the tip of the dorsal fin here was also dipped in some yellow. And again, often um, seen in big schools, swimming actively above the reef. You may see brown and blue chromis mixing together. You may see them mixing with um, other species of um, smaller grunts or wrasses. So it's always good to, when you see a mixed school like that, kind of slow down and take a look and um, see if you're reporting every species that's within the school. So um, we've wrapped up the damselfish and now I'm actually gonna hand it over to Stacy, and he's gonna uh, talk about some other fish families with you guys. All right, let's see. Perfect. So the next species we're gonna talk about are our grunts and snappers. Um, so this is kind of like Amy said with the queen angel fish, this is a, a blue striped grunt and kind of a picturesque fish of the keys. Um, grunts get their name um, because they kind of use their, grind their teeth together and they use their swim bladder to kind of amplify that, that noise and they kind of make a, a grunting noise, hence the name um, grunts. Um, the grunts are uh, a little bit smaller than the snappers, um, and snappers are, uh, they get their name from the behavior they make when they're caught on a fishing line, like kind of make like a, a snapping when, when you pull them up onto the boat, and that's kind of how they got their name. Uh, they also have kind of larger canine teeth that you can sometimes uh, see in their mouth. So this is the blue striped grunt, about 18 inches, so they're, they're pretty big. Uh, they often school together 
um, with other uh, grunts as well as other species of, of snappers and grunts. So you'll kind of see all of these together. Um, there are yellow fish with about those blue stripes going all the way down, kind of a neon color. And they also have that dark edging. I guess I can use this laser pointer. We've got the blue stripes going down the side and the dark edging on the tails. As you can see here, they, they group together in, in large schools. Um, like Amy said, with the chromises, there's often other species in these schools as well. So take a, take a second and look in, in these schools. Uh, they do like structure, so you'll see them under Elkhorn coral or large uh, artificial wrecks or any kind of structures where they like to hang out. Our next grunt is the French grunt. Very similar, um, yellow body, but you'll notice that the stripes are a little bit of a different color. They're kind of a silvery. You'll almost notice kind of a diagonal right there. If we go to the next slide, you'll kind of see that more prominent. Uh, these guys are a bit smaller than the blue stripe grunt, about 12 inches, um, but they kind of all still school together. Our next grunt kind of looks different than the, the blue stripe and the French grunt. Uh, they've got kind of an odd shaped sloping head, uh, but they have these two black bars on their face. And how they get their name, the pork fish, is it kind of looks like someone's taken a pork chop and put it on the grill. So they've got grill marks on their face. Um, so that's kind of how I remember these guys. Um, they're kind of solitary. They uh, school in small schools. So you'll kind of see one or two swimming along the reef or, or a small group of them. They're about 14 inches uh, in size. If you look at the, the juvenile here, it looks very different, but it's got a nice yellow head there with a black spot on its tail. Pretty small, only a couple inches in length. Um, but as they gets older, you can see it loses that black spot and develops those black bars there. And that's the, the pork fish. Moving on to our snappers, and I actually can see that canine pretty well on the schoolmaster snapper here. You can kind of see it there and there. I don't know if you guys can see it out in the crowd, but if you guys see these out on your snorkels or dives, take a look to see if you can see their, their teeth. Uh, this one is, is very large. It can get up to, to two feet. So it's a pretty large snapper, um, bigger than the other ones we've gone over. Um, not really any kind of stripes or bars, kind of a flat kind of silvery gray color. But you'll notice that it's got these yellow, this yellow coloration on all of its tail or all of its fins. And kind of how I look to remember is it, it's kind of the same color as a school bus. So it almost looks like a, a school bus, so the school master snapper, the school bus. I mean, you'll see these guys schooling together kind of really close to each other um, along that, that structure. And here's just another picture. Um, one thing I wanna point out is sometimes their juveniles do have some sort of uh, kind of bars on them. So sometimes the, the adults will retain some of that kind of bars going down the side. So if you do see some faint bars, it's probably still a schoolmaster just uh, kind of transitioning into an adult. So this one you probably all know, this is the yellow tail snapper. Um, like Amy said, the tail is a good indication of kind of where to find it. This is unlike the other snappers and grunts we've gone over, you find this fish in the uh, open water. You'll kind of see them swimming about the, the reef instead of hiding under structure. And they've got this yellow stripe going down the side, merging into their, their tail with the yellow tail snapper. You also see some kind of yellow blotching up towards above the, the midline there. Um, so these guys are in the water column. You'll often see them schooling together underneath boats. Um, so take a look under the boat. They're pretty, uh, pretty curious and inquisitive. They'll come right up to you and, and check you out, which is pretty cool. Next fish we're gonna go over are our groupers. Uh, groupers are large, heavy body fish with very large mouths, and they use that mouth to kind of create a lot of suction and force to ingest their prey. I um, mean, you'll kind of see they've got a really large, large mouth. <clears throat> and this is our Nassau grouper, about one to two feet long. Uh, the key identifying factor here is the black saddle here on the caudal peduncle. Um, they also have some rustic brown stripes here, uh, but I would look for that black saddle because uh, like a lot of fish, they can kind of alter their color depending on kind of their, their behavior. So sometimes kind of this coloration will be paled out or darkened out. So it can be tough to kind of tell. So I would look for that, that black saddle there. 
Um, and that's our NASA grouper. You'll find them generally prowling around the reef, uh, more or less unconcerned. They're not, they're not too, too shy, often curious. Um, and their numbers have greatly been reduced due to, to overfishing pressures and things like that. Um, and it's the kind of our focus of our grouper moon project, which we'll be talking about in uh, later seminars. And here's just another picture. You can kind of see more of its coloration on the tips of its uh, dorsal spines here. Um, he's kind of, he must be looking in a hole curious. There might be something in there. This is our next grouper. Uh, it's our Graysby, a lot smaller than our NASA grouper, about a foot in length. Um, Often they have a lot of spots on their body, as you can see here, but the spots I want you to pay attention to are these spots here. They have three to four kind of grazing spots along the dorsal side of the, um, the fish, right underneath their dorsal spine. Um, they can be alter in color, so they don't necessarily have to be white, um, or the fish doesn't necessarily have to be kind of this reddish color here. If you look at the second photo, those spots are still black, their spots are black, but they are, they're still there. Um, so look for those kind of grazing spots on the top of the fish. And you'll often see these guys perched on sponges, um, on rock ledges, kind of underneath the ledges or things like that, kind of looking for, for prey that swims by. The next species uh, we're going to talk about is our parrotfish. Uh, parrotfish are very interesting and very important fish to our uh, coral reefs. They have a powerful jaw and fused teeth that look like a beak. You can kind of see that, hence the name parrotfish. Uh, and what they do is they scrape algae off uh, rocks uh, or dead coral. And in doing that, they kind of ingest a little bit of that limestone rock. Um, and that passes through their system and gets um, excreted as sand. Um, so a lot of the sand we have on our beaches and on our reefs is actually from parrotfish, which is really interesting. And they also help kind of to control the, the algae population as well. So this is the, another interesting thing about parrotfish, and it kind of makes them hard to ID sometimes, is they have different phases. They'll have a juvenile phase, an intermediate phase, and a terminal phase. And that's because they can change uh, sex as they get older, or kind of depending on their life cycle. Um, this one here is the terminal phase, the last phase. Uh, it's a, generally a, a male um, and that's kind of the, the end of the road. It can't, can't transition back. Uh, so this is our stoplight parrotfish, which is the terminal phase of this particular species. Uh, you can tell by this nice yellow spot here and this yellow spot on the operculum. I always go kind of for this spot here, um, just because it's sometimes this color is a little faded. This spot will be um, very kind of bright and right there. Uh, they also have kind of, this color is a little blue, but it's got green, red, and yellow, so it kind of looks like a, a stoplight. This is the intermediate phase. Um, so this could be a, a mature female or an immature male. <clears throat> and uh, you can see how it can be tough to ID the, the stoplight parrotfish, because this is the exact same species as this one. So this one's ID'd by the red belly and red tail, along with kind of some dark margins um, outlining this, the scales. So this is the intermediate phase of the stoplight parrotfish. <clears throat> Next parrotfish we're going to go over is our red band parrotfish. Uniquely described, it's got a red band coming out of its, uh, kind of off its mouth. Um, it kind of looks like it's got a bloody lip or a kind of something like that. So it's got a, a red band coming off of its mouth. And this again is the terminal phase uh, male, adult male. And then this is the intermediate phase red band parrotfish. So again, very different. Um, the one for this one and kind of the, I, the clue I use is you can see right here is a white spot on its caudal peduncle. And it kind of looks like a band-aid. So there's a band-aid on the red band. And also kind of a, a molted, almost camouflage color. You can see it almost camouflaging right with the, the background here. Um, but I always look for that red, the Band-Aid on the red band. So the adult male's got that red band behind its mouth and the intermediate phase has the uh, Band-Aid. 
The next fish uh, species we're going to go over is the brass, uh, very similar and related to the parrotfish. And they kind of use the same, you'll notice them kind of swimming very similarly. Um, they kind of use their pectoral fin to kind of pull themselves over the reef. So they'll kind of almost hop kind of across the reef, which is really interesting to see. You'll also notice that the wrasse uh, are very torpedo shape. That's a good way of uh, kind of identifying that it's a wrasse. Um, it doesn't have a beak like a parrotfish, uh, but very similar. Uh, they also do the same thing um, with, they have different phases uh, where the adult uh, terminal phase will be the male. Um, and then the uh, intermediate phase will be the real, uh, mature male or a mature female. And rasp have uh, harems, so there'll be one male and a bunch of females together. So you'll see all of them together. We can go to the next slide here so we can kind of see it. So you'll see this adult male with a bunch of juveniles and, and females. Um, and once that, once that male dies or gets eaten or something like that, one of the females will transition into the male and kind of take over the harem, which is really interesting. This is our blue head wrasse. You can see it's got a nice, easy to identify blue head and almost an, an Oreo kind of in the middle, which is pretty cool. These are about, I don't know, a couple inches long cigar, which kind of shaped four to five, six, four to five inches long. Um, and the key identifying feature for the juveniles is this black spot you'll see right here. Um, you'll see a lot of these, these are very common. Uh, I think the most common is the, the blue tang, but the yellow head, you know, the blue head wrasse is a, is a close second. You'll see these all over on the tops of the reef as you're, as you're swimming by. The uh, intermediate phase kind of looks very similar to juvenile. It's got that black spot. It also can sometimes have some, some bars going, going down and that's how you'd identify the, the females are kind of the intermediate phase. Similar to the blue head wrasse, there's the yellow head wrasse. Very easy to identify. It's got that nice yellow head. This again is the uh, terminal phase adult. This is a great kind of story of the um, life of a yellow head parrotfish. Down here in the bottom, you can see the juvenile orange kind of rustic color with a blue stripe kind of going down the side. And this can be kind of like a neon color. Um, and one thing to look and an easy identifying if it doesn't have that kind of distinct yellow head is it has eyelashes. And you'll kind of see that even on the, the juvenile phase going into the intermediate phase to the terminal adult male, which is a, a good thing to, to pay attention. These guys are a little bigger than the blue head wrasse, um, about five to six inches, so a little bit bigger. Um, and you won't see these quite as often as the, the blue head wrasse. Another species that's related is the, Span is the hogfish. Um, this is our Spanish hogfish. Um, you'll kind of see this guy more or less by itself. It won't congregate together like our other species. And it's still that torpedo shape and using its, its pectoral fins to kind of pull itself along. Uh, very bright yellow color with this almost purple, I call it almost like a cape. And what kind of my way of IDing it is it almost, it's like a matador, a Spanish matador. Um, so it's got that purple purple cape. And that cape can come, sometimes be a little larger and take up a little bit more of the body, or sometimes the purple can almost cover the entire body. In some species, I've seen some bigger ones that are almost all purple, but you can still have that typical body shape um, and in color. And here's just another picture of you can almost see it's a little, that purple is in a little different spot. Uh, the jack we're going to talk about today is our bar jack. Again, look at the, the tail. It can kind of give you a good idea of where you're going to find it. This is a strong open sea predator. Um, you'll kind of see passing over the reef. Usually kind of a silvery color um, with large eyes and that deep forked tail. So they do a lot of swimming. Also a typical feature of kind of jacks and mackerels is this dorsal fin and this anal fin. They're almost always in line. So if you see that, that's a good indication that it's a, a jack. This is our bar jack. Uh, it's pretty small. Um, it can get up to 14 inches, but usually kind of when you're seeing it on the reef around eight, eight to 12 inches. <clears throat> you have this black line that runs from the dorsal fin all the way down the caudal fin. 
Uh, and that's the, the distinct ID marker of this, of the bar jack. Um, in addition to kind of being the silver, silvery color, it'll change colors depending on its uh, behavior. So sometimes you'll see ones that are all black and that's what, sometimes they're doing what's called a shadow hunting is where they'll follow like a stingray or something like that that's rummaging in the sand, waiting for something to kind of get spooked out so they can, they can collect it. And they like to school together, so you'll often see multiple together, um, not necessarily by themselves. This is a, one of my favorites, the smooth trunked fish. It's kind of very oddly shaped. You can kind of see the profile here, but when looking at it head on, it almost looks like a triangular. And you, it's got all these white spots on it, but it also has this kind of honeycomb pattern in the center, um, as well as it, it can kind of be lighter or, or, or darker, kind of depending on, on what it's doing. You also notice this kind of unique looking mouth. It kind of uses that to push the sand away um, to kind of find invertebrates and things like that. <clears throat> and you'll see these guys mostly, you'll see them along the reef. Uh, I kind of see them most often on that, those sand flats, pushing uh, the sand away with their mouth. And what I really like about these guys is their juveniles are really cool to find. They're, they're about the size of a pea and they look exactly like a pea with polka dots. Um, so very small and they kind of can't really move around all that well. So they kind of just float around and you'll see them in, in, inside like cracks and crevices and things like that. It's a very cool thing to find. Next is our scrawled file fish. Uh, this uh, file fish have kind of a, um, how they get their name is they have a singular elongated dorsal spine. It's tough to see it in this picture, but they'll, when uh, stressed out, they'll kind of uh, stick that dorsal spine out and it's, it's called the, the file. Very unique body shape. They kind of look like somebody took a blue marker or a black marker and scrawled all over it. So it's kind of got that blue and black color with a very broom-like tail. It's got some variation in that kind of scribbling or scrawling on the, on the body as well. These guys are very, uh, <clears throat> They're not shy. I usually, if I see one, I usually see it the whole dive. It kind of follows me around. So they're not too shy. The only puffer we're going to talk about is our sharp nose puffer, uh, two to three inches, so very small. Uh, puffers have a unique ability to take in water and expand their size to kind of make it difficult for predators or um, kind of get them to go away. Uh, they also have powerful jaws and fused teeth that they use to kind of crush shelled invertebrates. You can kind of see that here, almost kind of looks like the, the parrot fish mouth as well. <clears throat> they've got a yellow to white tail. You can see the yellow there and the white, but they've got this black margin that starts on their uh, caudal fin. And you notice that it only starts about the tail. Very common, see these under, under underhangs um, around, around structure. Very cute little guys. And the last fish we're gonna go over today before we start our quick quiz is our yellowhead jawfish. These guys are really cool to find. They've got a nice yellow head with a bluish to white kind of hued body. You'll find these guys, they live in burrows. So you'll see them, their heads poking out. So if you get level with like a sand flat or a, a rubble flat and kind of look over parallel to the sand, you sometimes can see them, them popping up. They're very shy so they need a close approach or kind of some patience to wait for them to come back out. But they have that distinct yellow head. Another interesting thing is their mouth brooders. So the males will brood the eggs in their mouth. So if you ever see one, take a close look at their mouth to see if it has any eggs. This is a picture of one kind of in its hole. And I would say that's pretty, that's how you're going to find them. And as you get closer, they'll kind of tuck back into that hole. All right, thank you guys so much. I think we're gonna do a quick quiz. All right, so what I'll have you guys do uh, is we'll go over a fish. We'll show you a picture of a fish and kind of think about what species it is, and then we'll, we'll go over what it is. And for everyone at home, if you have a piece of paper and pencil, you can try and write it down and we'll go over it um, after a short pause. So with our first fish, 
kind of look at uh, the, the features of the, the distinct features of this fish, kind of look at the, the coloration and any, any markings that stand out. Um, to me, this, this kind of patch here and this, uh, this yellow dot here and kind of the colorations of this fish stand out. All right. So this is our stoplight parrotfish. It's got all the colors of a stoplight. It's got that distinct yellow marking above the operculum. Um, it's got kind of a, a beak with that um, red, yellow, and green coloration to it. Uh, the next fish we have, uh, this one is, is very small. Um, I'd say about two to three inches, pretty small. Um, it's got this nice distinct dark margin on its tail. Um, another, again, unique mouth there. All right, a couple more seconds. This is our sharp nose puffer. Um, so very small and these guys, it's got the distinct puffer fish, puffer fish body, those black margins on the tail there. Ah, so this one, it, these are both the same fish. They're just kind of, they're exhibiting different behavior. And it's difficult to kind of see the identifying marker on, on this one, but I would look at this black line that's going from the dorsal fin all the way to the tail. I think you told everyone too that during the presentation when you covered this fish that they can get really dark. So that would be a good clue. All right, this is our bar jack. So you've got that bar going to the dorsal fin and this one is exhibiting that behavior of shadow hunting. So it's kind of mimicking a shadow of the fish so a prey might not see it when, when they get close. All right, I think way back for this one. Feels like it's been a while since we talked about it, but notice the cheek spine. Remember that that's a key feature of one of the families we discussed. Let's share, yeah, let's share the answer to this one. This one is a rock beauty in the angelfish family. All right. So this guy, we went over, um, take a look at this marking here um, and it, its mouth. It's got a very unique mouth. You almost gave it away by saying it. <laughs> <laughs> so this is the red band parrotfish. It's got that red band coming off of its mouth, and it's got that kind of fused beak-like teeth that are used to eat algae off of the, the substrate. All right, another one from the first half of the presentation, commonly seen in pairs with the bar running through the eye. Black and white body coloration. So let's share the answer to this one. This is a banded butterfly fish. Well, these are banded butterfly fish. All right, this is one of those species that is very distinct, torpedo shaped. You can see it's swimming with its pectoral fins there. And he's even got some, some markings above the eye here. I would, the easiest way to identify this fish is that nice coloration on its head. And this is the yellow head wrasse, very distinctive yellow head. Uh, very similar. Uh, this is one of those species I talked to you that was kind of a, this is a weird coloration, I would say, of, of this particular species. Um, but I would take note of the body shape as well as the kind of colors you're seeing on this fish. This is our Spanish hogfish. And like I said, sometimes that, that matador cape can sometimes envelop the whole body, but it's still got that, that body shape and that purple and, and yellow color. Okay, very first fish we talked about this afternoon. Um, remember who wears the crown and has the bright yellow tail. Those are your keys to look for. The crown is that area at the top, um, the blue spots ringed in the brilliant blue color. 
So we call, we call that a crown because this fish is royalty. So this is the queen angelfish. Uh, this is almost. Oh, this is like a two for one. Two for one. <laughs> um, so either of these fish, uh, if you guys know either or both, you'll be right here. There's, I believe we're talking about this fish in the foreground here with the Oreo marking in the middle and a certain color on the head that gives it its name and then yellow on the back of the body. Yeah, so bluehead wrasse. And then I believe in the background, we have an ocean surgeon fish, which we also talked about. So we like to call that photo bycatch when you get more than one species in a picture. All right, this one um, in the angelfish family, I hear a lot of people saying that. Uh, remember cobblestone streets on this one to uh, help you remember the name. Yes, yeah, straight tail as well. So, so this is the gray angelfish. These ones, uh, often seen in pairs, kind of flitting about the reef. Um, remember, they've got their real eye and then their false eye or ocellus, and that's how they get their name. They're kind of the soft, buttery yellow color and uh, small ovals. Yeah, I hear some, hear some people saying the answer, four eye butterfly fish, good job. All right, our next one. Notice the scalpel on the base of the tail, the body coloring. I'm not going to say it, I might give it away, but that scalpel is uh, bright yellow. So that's your key that you want to look for. Sounds like some people know it blue tang in the surgeon fish family. All right, I think we covered this one already, but another photo of it snuck in. So we'll uh, just do a review, breeze through it quickly. I um, think you guys all know what this one is. Banded butterfly fish. All right. This is one of those uh, heavy body, large mouth fish that we, we talked about. Um, it could be tough to tell in this particular picture, picture but you want to look for these three to four, three to five black dots kind of towards the dorsal fin. This is our grazeby, so those black dots kind of look like they're grazing the fish, just almost missing it. Um, Question was, how do you tell the difference between a grazeby and a rock kind? Just so everyone can hear. Yeah, Amy, do you want to take that one? Sure, yeah. Um, so a rock kind is going to have way more, um, way darker or uh, more noticeable blotches running along the back. The grazebees are really just little dots, um, almost like bullet holes, if you will. Um, whereas the rock kind, it almost looks like they're um, little pieces of gravel or boulders. So rocks, little rocks. Um, they're not distinct circles. Um, and they're larger and they um, kind of don't run in a straight line along the back. Sometimes they can be um, kind of placed almost like out of order. So um, the really the area along the back is what um, you would want to look for for as far as markings. The grazeby is also smaller as well. The rock hind can get a little bit bigger. So um, generally, I feel like the grazeby is more commonly seen, smaller, um, almost more shy also. Um, we often say that there's another fish that looks similar to the grazeby called a coney. Um, and grazebees will show you their back half and conies will show you their front half. So it feels like a grazebee is always kind of swimming away from you. So those are uh, just some ways that I would tell the difference. All right, going on to our next heavy body large fish. Um, you can't quite tell, see it on this one, but there's a something black spot over here on its caudal peduncle. Very large mouth, huge, huge lips, and it's got that kind of tear-dropped eye, which is typical of the species. This is our Nassau grouper. It's 
got that black spot on the caudal peduncle. Um, you can kind of see in this one, it's it's a darker kind of coloration. So sometimes it's gonna be difficult to see those, those stripes. <laughs> I think a lot of you guys got this right away. Uh, for those at home, you wanna look at this yellow um, stripe going down the side, going down to the, the tail. Tail is a good indication of this, this species. This is a very appropriately named fish, our yellow tail snapper. Okay, another one of our damsel fish. Again, take a look at the deeply forked tail and the body color to kind of remember what this one is. I hear a lot of people with the answer, so we'll go ahead and share it. This is a brown chromis. All right, this is the one of, one of the first ones I talked about. I think a lot of you guys have mentioned it already. Yes, it's in the grunt family. Um, you want to look at the kind of the silvery stripes and kind of these ones are kind of upward, kind of diagonal looking. This is our French grunt, different from our, our blue striped grunt. It does not have the blue stripes in the dark margins on the tail. This is a head-on uh, picture of one of the fish we talked about. Look in its mouth, you can see those nice sharp teeth and the yellow uh, yellow fins, very brightly yellowed fins. Just like a school bus, this is our schoolmaster snapper. So similar to our, our French grunt, you can see those dark margins or dark kind of coloration on the tail and the dorsal fin and those blue stripes, blue striped grunt. Okay, uh, everyone's favorite, the territorial damsel. I would not get in the water if this fish was any bigger. Just kidding. Um, this one, we talked about how it can have three colors or two. I'm hearing some people with the answer. Um, so this is the bicolor damselfish, showing a little bit of yellow, not quite as much yellow in some of the other photos we looked at. So let's go ahead and share the answer for the people at home. Yep, bicolor damselfish. All right, so looks like we're running short on time, so we'll kind of speed through these last couple ones. Yeah, because we do want to give you guys, if you have any questions, um, at the end, we'll come around with a microphone. So this one here, obviously the tail, we all know this is the yellowtail damsel. This one, a bit of a tricky photo, but we did talk about how they guard their eggs and get really dark like this. So this is an egg guarding sergeant major in the damselfish family. This one, notice the vertical bars on the body and that dark colored scalpel. Remember that their spine is as sharp as a surgeon's scalpel. So this species is doctor fish in the surgeon fish family. This one, same family. Again, take a look at the pectoral fin. Notice that it's clear and the scalpel is dark in color. So that would make this an ocean surgeon fish. All right, these guys have that nice coloration on the head. It doesn't quite cover just as much of it. But yep, you guys are right. This is a jawfish that lives in a, a burrow and this is our yellowhead jawfish. I love that picture. I like the, the blue in the eye. Uh, this one, the body color really gives it away. Deeply forked tail, so we know that their behavior is swimming up above the reef. And of course, this one is blue, so that is a blue chromis. Yep. <laughs> Looks like somebody drew all over this. It's got a broom tail, very oddly shaped mouth. This is our scrawled filefish. This one, another stunning photo. Uh, notice the scales are yellow, like French is mustard. So there's your clue. Um, dark in color, dinner plate size, cheek spine. So this one is the French angelfish. 
All right, another one of the odd looking swimmers. You got that odd, that kind of mouth that's used to blow the sand away, that honeycomb pattern with the, the white spots. This is our smooth trunk fish. All right, that was the last one. Thank you guys so much for joining us. Uh, we'll open it up to some quick questions. Before we do, um, if you guys enjoyed this presentation or you're interested in learning more, uh, we have online webinars called Fishinars. Uh, we have over 200 archived on our website um, from all of our different regions, um, varying from kind of beginner level all the way to advanced uh, level as well. They're all free as long as you're a reef member. Um, well, it, you can watch, you have to be a member to watch them, um, and but membership is, is free. Um, once you create a member, uh, log in, log in, and you can watch those fish in ours. Um, it's perfect for self-study, review, um, enjoying with friends, anything like that. Uh, we also have Facebook groups for each of our regions. Our region uh, in the Keys is the Tropical Western Atlantic. This is a group of people who will post questions, pictures of fish they need help identifying. Um, it's just kind of a, a way to get together and kind of post what you're seeing um, from each of the different regions, um, and that's on Facebook. <laughs> All Thank right, you. so that wraps it up for us, and we've got this cute little balloon fish. So uh, we want to say best fishes. Thanks for listening, and happy surveying for all who are going out diving or snorkeling this weekend. Um, and if anyone has any questions, we're happy to take a couple of those. Yes. Um, so the question for everyone at home is how to tell the difference between a Townsend angelfish and a queen angelfish. So do you want to scroll back to the queen angelfish slide at the beginning? Um, and I'll just kind of talk through as he's doing that, or the first queen angelfish picture we come across. Um, the queen angelfish and another species called the blue angelfish um, can interbreed, they can hybridize and form uh, what is known as the Townsend angelfish, which is a hybrid species. Um, and it does have some differences. The queen has a very, very vivid, distinct crown at the top. Again, that's that marking on the nape or the forehead. It also has a um, distinct, completely yellow tail. Townsend markings can vary, but there is often some blue in the tail or the yellow is not vivid like that. It's faded and then um, it's kind of vivid on the tail margin, but the rest of the tail is um, kind of pale yellow or blue fading to yellow. The crown is also not as vivid. It may not be as developed as that as well. So they may not have that brilliant blue, um, the brilliant blue dots in the center, or it may not um, look as fluorescent. The body coloration may be a little bit more drab and pale as well. So you're not gonna notice as much of those brilliant blue accents like on the eyelid or around the um, margins of the body. So um, it varies a little bit, but the more that you see the queen and notice those features, and then the more that you are aware of the features of the blue angelfish, which differ a little bit, um, you'll be able to determine um, whether you're looking at a Townsend, which is a hybrid of those two species or not. Does anyone have any other questions? Okay, well, I think we're all set. So thank you so much. All right, well, we all made it through that, right? Anybody learn anything? Yes, okay, that's what we like to see. Great, wonderful. All right, just reminding you that tonight, again, open house at Reef uh, Campus. And then tomorrow, back here at the Government Center, um, we have speakers and mixing and mingling and book signing with Ned and Anna, all sorts of things taking place tomorrow um, around the 2.30-ish start time, 2.30-ish, so head on over here about then. Um, we also have some great speakers tomorrow, um, Christy and Bryce and Allie and um, Scott will be talking to us stories from the field. So that's going to be really fun. I'm looking forward to that. We'll have a happy hour at 4.30 here. 
Um, and then Ned and Anna and Paul, uh, Jim Delapazzi will also be talking to us on the heady hunt for 5,000 fishes. So I don't think I've seen 5,000, but they have. Anyway, okay, so, and then Saturday, even more. So anytime you want to go to reef dot org slash reef fest that's going to be two f's there in the middle reef fest and the whole schedule and everything you need to know is right there so go take a look at that okay so we are going to break now for 12 minutes and 57 seconds and then i want you back in here again and we're going to be doing a lionfish workshop after that so hopefully we'll see you back go out mix mingle have fun um, don't forget to come back later. And thank you, Amy and Stacy, for a great job on all those lovely fish. Yeah, thank right. you. Thank and you. Thanks to everyone right. who watched at home.
thank you guys for joining us for the Lionfish Workshop today. Um, this is Reef's 146th Lionfish Workshop. Um, we've reached 1,746 participants so far, so you're adding to that list. Um, and a lot of our workshops actually include um, dives after them, so if you are in the Florida area or you come down here regularly, keep an eye out for those because you can jump on a lionfish dive for free and we go out and collect lionfish and you get to practice using spears. Um, so it's a lot of fun. So uh, Madeline or Moose Mussy is going to actually pre presenting this condensed version of our lionfish workshop today. And Moose was actually my lead scientist. Uh, she was my lead intern. I lead the invasive species program. I'm Ali Kandelma, by the way. Um, <laughs> And um, because she was such an amazing intern and such a huge contribution to Reef, we've kept her on. She's now our invasive, our education and outreach program manager. And this year alone, she's led 18 education programs on lionfish curriculum, reaching over 200 people. So she's been a, just an amazing, amazing um, Reef member from the start. And we're, we're really lucky to have her here. Um, Another little fun fact about Moose is that she's had four concussions since she started at Reef. But as far as I know, right now, she's completely <laughs> awake and <laughs> unconcussed. So take it away. Thank you, Allie. Yes, I've had eight concussions in total. So if I forget something, I'll just tag Allie in. So yeah, she knows more than I do. Um, but yes, hello, my name is Madeline Mussey. Like Ali said, I'm the Education Outreach Program Manager. Most people know me as Moose around Reef, so feel free to call me basically any M name and I'll probably answer to it. Uh, if you wanna know how I got the name Moose, I won't tell you, you just have to guess. So today we'll be talking about the invasive lionfish. So as Ali said, we have an invasive species program at Reef. It's one of our main programs. It's definitely one of our most popular programs for people to learn about because it is really interesting. Our focus is on the invasive lionfish, but we do work with other non-native and exotic species as well. But since this one's so uh, predominant in this region, that has become our focus. So invasive lionfish. During this presentation, we're gonna hit a couple main points. The first one is we're just gonna go over general lionfish information. So we're gonna talk about where lionfish came from, how they got here, what is a lionfish, what makes it so unique, and why is it such a perfect invader? Then we'll go over why lionfish are a problem. So we know all of their adaptations that they have. How is that affecting this environment here? What effect is that having on those native species? And then lastly, we'll talk about population control and solutions. We know that they're a problem. We know that they're here. How can we get rid of them if we can ever get rid of them completely? So we'll talk about different methods that people are using to control those populations in ways that you guys could get involved as individuals as well. Before we get started, I kind of want to show of hands to see how familiar people are with lionfish. So on a scale of one to five, one being you don't really know anything about lionfish except their name, and five being that you're an expert on lionfish, you know everything there is to know about lionfish. Where do you guys think you are? People raise hands with the numbers. We've got some twos, threes, lots of twos, lots of, oh, we got a five back there, was that a five over there? No? In the tie-dye? No. Oh, I thought you raised a five. I was like, oh man, an expert. <laughs> Allie's an expert. Daryl's an expert. Great. I would hope so, but good. So hopefully those of you who are kind of in the middle learn something new today. Maybe the experts, I'll give you a new fun fact. We'll see. So before we get into the actual lionfish, we have to know what a non-native, exotic, and invasive species is. So there is a difference between non-native and exotic versus invasive. Does anybody know what the difference might be? And yes, I'm gonna ask a lot of questions during this presentation, so if people don't volunteer, I'm just gonna start picking on people. So does anyone wanna tell me, shout out, what the difference might be between a non-native species versus an invasive species? In the back, Claude. He said, how much they hurt the natives. Everybody agree with that? How much they're impacting the native? Yes, yeah. Yeah, that's basically it. So non-native means they're not from here, they didn't evolve here, they're not supposed to be here, but they're not really having too much of a negative impact on this ecosystem. Whether it be because they get removed before they're able to you know, um, reproduce and establish here, or because they're just really not having a huge effect on them. Invasive, on the flip side of that, would be that they are having a negative impact on the ecosystem. They're not from here, they didn't evolve here, and they are causing damage to either the ecosystem itself or the native species in that ecosystem. 
So all these fish on this page are examples of non-native or exotic fish that have been found in Florida waters and removed. Um, Reef partners with USGS and the Frost Museum of Science and NOAA to help um, keep track of non-native and exotic marine species and to go out and take them out of Florida waters before they become a problem like the lionfish. So that's what's called a rapid response team, basically a fancy term for a bunch of interns with nets. So they, we get a, um, a call or an email saying, hey, I think I saw this fish. It's not supposed to be here. And the Volunteer Fish Survey Project has actually helped a lot with tracking non-native and exotic and invasive species throughout the world. So we get a notification that, hey, there's a fish that's not supposed to be here. We confirm it with a picture or we go see it ourselves. And then we take the necessary steps to go ahead and remove that fish before it becomes a problem. You can actually see a couple species that have been removed by Reef in partnership with these organizations at the Frost Museum of Science up in Miami. If you guys are locals around here, or you come down here a lot and you haven't been to the Frost Museum, it's a really cool place to go. Uh, my favorite part is the aquarium section, of course, as an ocean and fish lover. It's a really cool place to check out. So definitely go and find it uh, and find out what it's all about if you have a chance. The difference between lionfish and all of those fish is the fact that they did become invasive. They became established, which means that they spread enough, they reproduced enough to where their populations were now there all year round, and they were basically growing larger than the other populations of fish. So lionfish are actually the first marine invasive fish to become established in the Atlantic Ocean. With that came a lot of problems, as you probably know, or if you don't know, you'll find out today. There was no examples, no protocols, nothing that we could go off of to help us solve this invasion. So basically everybody had to start from scratch to control the invasive lionfish population. So over the last um, couple decades and even the last couple years, we've learned a lot about lionfish and how to control them, but it's still an ever ongoing process because it was the first marine invasive fish to become invasive and established here in the Atlantic. So taking a guess, there are other species of lionfish throughout the world, and there are specific species that are invasive here. Throughout the world, in their native regions, does anybody have a guess on how many species of lionfish there are? I'll give you a hint, it's not 16. Everybody always wants to guess that. Shout out some numbers, what do you guys think? What do you think? Eight, all right. What about somebody back there, what do you think? 10, what do you think? 24, that's a big number. You guys are all around the same guess. There's about 20 species of lionfish around the world in their native region. How many do you guys think are invasive here in the tropical Western Atlantic? How many species? Got two, all of them. Jana thinks all of them. One, 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 we got a two. Jana said all of them, so all 20 species. It is actually two species of lionfish that are invasive here. The red lionfish and the devil firefish highlighted in those yellow boxes. So you can't really tell the difference between the two species just by looking at them. We found out through genetic testing that there were two invasive fish here. You're more commonly going to hear the name red lionfish than devil firefish. Um, but those are the two species that we have here in the tropical Western Atlantic that have become invasive and established. Um, where do you guys think these lionfish came from originally? What area of the world? The Red Sea. Anything else? Any what was that? Australia, Australia, the Red Sea, so Pacific area maybe. You guys are pretty on par there. So we got the red lionfish highlighted in green in their native region, and we got the devil firefish highlighted in blue in their native region. So that's where they're from originally, the Indo-Pacific area. And then this red area over here, that is the invasive region in the tropical Western Atlantic. You can see this cross hatching pattern down the coast of South America right there. This map was made a couple of years ago now. That cross, cross hatching represented an area where researchers believed lionfish could move to and become established in. And now they have found that they have become established in some parts of that area. So some of this cross hatching can now be filled in further south. So they have a pretty big invasive region throughout the tropical Western Atlantic. Yes. Yep, right here in the, the red lionfish region over here. Yeah. 
Oh, yes, sorry. Thank you for the reminder, Jana. So she asked, they don't have any in Australia. They are, there are some in Australia. And remember, there are 20 species of lionfish out there too. So there are other different kinds of lionfish that you can find in these regions as well. So looking at the two different areas, the Indo-Pacific area and then the tropical Western Atlantic, how did the red lionfish and devil firefish get from here all the way over here? What do you guys think? Pets, somebody brought it. Any other guesses? On a boat. In a hull. So ballast water, is that what you're thinking? Yeah. So some people guess ballast water. Um, the ship's taking the water and they transport the lionfish unknowingly to different parts of the world. While that does happen to a lot of species, probably didn't happen to lionfish. They would have released the water far before then. And also, it's just not likely that lionfish got sucked up into there. But a lot of people thought that. Some people thought that hurricanes um, broke aquariums in Florida and then released them from there. But the first major hurricane that happened that could have caused that happened four years after the initial sightings of lionfish. So while that may have um, help spread lionfish once they were here, it didn't cause the initial problem. So what we believe happened is people had them in their private aquariums and then released them unknowingly into the ocean. They thought, hey, this is a marine fish. I'm just going to put it back to where it came from because I don't want it anymore or whatever they thought. So I would really like to talk to the person who released the first lionfish because I want to know why they did it and then if they know that they caused this problem. But so that's how lionfish, we believe, became invasive in the first place, is through private aquarium releases of some sort, people having them as pets. They're very pretty fish. We have one as an education fish that we keep. Um, his name is Baby Hog. He was caught by a derby team. Um, and they're very nice to look at, so I understand why people would want them in their aquariums. But this is one of the reasons why we want to educate people and you know let them know how this probably happened. Same thing with like the pythons, the iguanas. Don't release your exotic pets, because then they become could become a huge problem like this. So that's where they are now found in their invasive area. This is to show the distribution over time. So you see in the top left-hand corner, we have the years ticking away and then the little red dots starting to appear in Florida. So it starts in 1985. The first lionfish was sighted not too far north from here in Dania Beach, Florida. And then it takes a couple years, but eventually they start to spread up the East Coast right here. And then they start to switch south into the Bahamas, into the Caribbean. And then right around 2010, it just kind of explodes through the Caribbean. And then lastly, in the Gulf of Mexico. So we'll go through that one more time. So again, it starts in 1985, right here in Dania Beach, slowly starts to spread throughout Florida, and then up the east coast of the United States. And then all of a sudden, it switches down into the Caribbean, the Bahamas area. And lastly, right around 2010, explodes to the rest of the tropical Western Atlantic. So looking at that spread, where it's first spreading up the east coast of the United States, why would it go that way first and not down? Any guesses? What was that? Currents. She said currents. That is correct. So we have a big current right here, the Gulf Stream right there, that is carrying their eggs up there. So their eggs, when they're released, they're buoyant. So they're meant to float in currents. That's how they transport themselves. Sorry. I'm still, I've never talked with a microphone, so if I'm like. I talk with my hands a lot, so it's kind of difficult for me. But yeah, the Gulf Stream carries their eggs up the east coast of the United States. That's how they spread that far north. As soon as a tropical storm, tropical depression, hurricane comes through, those currents reverse. And that's how they're able to get through the rest of the Caribbean and Gulf of Mexico. So that's how they're able to spread is through the currents, through the storms, through all sorts of stuff like that. This is a more accurate representation of the invasion now. So that distribution map was to kind of show the different sightings that were happening throughout all of, you know, the couple decades that lionfish first became sighted to now. Now we know that they're just kind of everywhere. So this completely red map, like I said, is a little more accurate. And again, it can now spread a little bit more south down the coast of South America. Their invasion can spread. So that's a pretty big invasive area for basically one fish even though there are two species they're basically the same fish you know we can they look the same they act the same behave the same so it's pretty impressive even though they are causing a lot of problems it's pretty interesting how one species can just affect such a huge area like that 
So we know that they have a really large distribution, but how dense are their populations? And you know, people wanted to figure that out. How many of them exactly are there in the different areas? So there's a study done to compare lionfish densities in their native range to their invasive range. So this is lionfish densities in their native range. We got one, the Marquesas, and then two, the Red Sea, two different areas. So they measured in terms of a hectare. So a hectare is about the size of a soccer field. So in the Marquesas, we have about three lionfish on average in the area of a soccer field. So imagine you're diving in the Marquesas, you might see three lionfish on a dive maybe. Then you go to the Red Sea, you see about 80 lionfish per hectare or in the area of a soccer field. So three to 80 lionfish on average on a dive, that's not too bad. Three lionfish is kind of low, especially if it's in their native range, but nothing too crazy. Compare that to a study done in the Bahamas in their invasive range, they found upwards of 400 lionfish per hectare on average. That's a huge difference. So the densities are a lot higher in their invasive range than they are in their native range. It's thought that if you redid the study today, that study was done quite a few years ago, the numbers would be even higher in certain areas, especially areas that maybe they aren't as controlled as frequently, removed as frequently. So it's upwards um, off the chart. Basically, if you put it into a circle graph, the Marquesas wouldn't even be visible because it's so much higher than um, their native range, than just three lionfish. That's pretty bad. That's obviously a problem. So we know that lionfish are, have a large distribution and they have high densities, high population numbers. What habitats are they hanging out in? Where exactly can we find lionfish? To better remove lionfish, we have to be able to know where we can go underwater and get them. So what do you guys think? What habitats do lionfish like to hang out in underwater? Reefs? Anything else? Structure. That's a good one, yeah. So lionfish really do like structure. They like to hang out on structure. They basically don't have a habitat preference except for the fact that they really do like structure. You won't really find them out swimming around in the open ocean too often. So coral reefs are a big one. Obviously, there's a lot of prey fish on coral reefs that they can consume. So shallow coral reefs, deep coral reefs. Uh, they really like shipwrecks, even artificial structure they'll hang out on. They'll be found really deep a lot too. They've even been found in shallow water and mangroves, brackish areas. That's a concern because mangroves and shallow areas are usually a nursery habitat for a lot of our coral reef species. So they're consuming young juvenile prey a lot of times before they can grow up and reproduce. So that's a problem in itself. There was a lionfish found in the Loxahatchee River in Florida. That's around West Palm area, I believe, uh, just north of like Miami, Fort Lauderdale area. It was found four miles upstream in the river. And the salinity where it was found is about eight parts per thousand. The salinity of seawater is 35 parts per thousand. So about a quarter of the salinity of seawater it was living in. And this is a marine fish. So they're supposed to live in seawater, you know. So the fact that it was found four miles upstream in this river surviving, that's pretty crazy. On the flip side of that, we've also found lionfish really, really deep. So this was a submarine that went down to a wreck and found some lionfish. You can see some there, right there. They've been found up to a thousand feet deep almost undersea. So that's a pretty wide range in distribution. Uh, one thing I got forgot to point out in the map though, but there was even lionfish sightings way up north on the east coast of the United States by Massachusetts area. What's so crazy about lionfish being found up by Massachusetts? It's cold there. They're a tropical marine fish, right? Compare that to here in the Keys in the summer where it gets 88, 89 degrees in the summer and up there it gets much colder. Lionfish have a thermal tolerance of about 50 degrees Fahrenheit. So they can survive in colder water, warm water, really deep water, really shallow water, low salinity, high salinity. So they have a wide range of types of habitats they can live in. So that's probably one of the reasons why they've been so successful is they can survive in so many different places. So lionfish are found throughout the tropical western Western Atlantic, basically everywhere, especially on your deeper reefs, especially in places where people might not remove them as often. What exactly is that doing to our native ecosystems? What is that doing to the native fish here? So looking at this picture, we see a lot of what? What is there a lot of? This is not a trick question also. 
<laughs> Everybody always gets really nervous when I ask that question. They're like, oh, I don't know. There's a lot of lionfish. I don't know if I'm supposed to say that or not. Yes, there's a lot of lionfish in this picture. Is there a lot of any other fish? No, the answer is no, there's not. That's, again, not a trick question. So not a lot of other fish, pretty much no other fish in the picture, lots of lionfish. And this is a pretty common scene to come across if there's an area that has been taken over by lionfish. You won't see a lot of other species hanging out there, either because the lionfish preyed on all of them, ate them all, or because they kind of learned what lionfish were, and they're like, oh, I'm going to get out of here. So lionfish are having quite a bit of impact, yes. Do they eat each other? It has been documented that they will consume each other. I don't think it's super common. So, yeah. If there's no other food. A piranha will do that? Oh, I didn't know that. Piranhas will eat their kind if there's no other fish. Okay, great. Yeah, so it has been documented. It's not super common, I don't think. So, but, you know, besides other lionfish, they consume a lot of different kinds of prey. Lionfish have been documented with over 170 different species of prey in their stomachs. That's a huge range of species that they're eating. Most fish have, most predators have a set type of prey that they prey on. Lionfish don't really have a preference. They just eat whatever's in front of them. The bad thing about this is they're eating a lot of different important species. So, for example, they're eating a lot of um, commercially important fish, like snapper, juvenile grouper, that sort of stuff that we consume, that we make a living off of. They're also eating a lot of recreationally important fish, like Spanish hogfish. People love to see Spanish hogfish or fairy basslets. They're really pretty. People like to see them. Squirrel fish. If they're eating all the fish that people want to see, and then all those fish are now gone, you're going to get less recreational divers and snorkelers in those areas because they're just not seeing the types of fish that they want to see. They're also eating um, ecologically important fish, like juvenile parrotfish. They're even eating cleaner shrimp and cleaner fish, which is totally against the rules of the animal kingdom. They, you won't really see them getting cleaned by other things because they'll just end up eating them. So they're eating a lot of species that help keep algae down in the reefs, that help clean parasites off of other fish. So all around, that's not good. Not only are they consuming a lot of different kinds of fish, a lot of different species of marine animals, but they're consuming a lot in one sitting. So this is an example of a lionfish that ate way too much in one sitting. It had 64 prey fish in its stomach plus one shrimp. So looking at these fish too, you can see that they're all about the same rate of digestion, which means that it really did eat it within a short time period. No fish needs to eat 64 fish fish and a little shrimp um, in one sitting. They're very gluttonous. They also eat fish that are way too big for them. So this is probably a juvenile parrotfish that we found in its stomach, and you can see it's kind of half digested. Its stomach is bulging a lot. So the back half of the fish was probably in its throat. So it didn't even fit all the way in its stomach and it decided to eat it anyways. It's not uncommon to find like tails or something sticking out of the fish's mouth. So this is a goatfish that got eaten by lionfish, almost half of the length of its body, tail sticking out of its mouth. Obviously this fish should not have consumed something that big, but lionfish will eat whatever fits in the width of their mouth, not really what fits down the length of their stomach. So that's another example right there. Here's another example. It ate almost 100 silver sides in one sitting. This was a fish that I remember specifically because I was, um, me and Allie were out doing lionfish research with a charter down here. And this was a fish that I saw get speared. And um, it was eating as it was getting speared. So it just that have a one track mind. They want to eat. That's all they want. So here's another example, 21 fish in its stomach. You can see some juvenile grunts or maybe snappers in there too. So important reef fish to have. So obviously just looking at those pictures, you can tell that that's going to have an impact on something. But what exactly is that impact going to be? Dr. Stephanie Green did a research study in the Bahamas to see what impacts lionfish could be having on the bohemian reef fish populations. And she found over 18 months they decreased the reef fish populations in some areas up to 65% on average. In other areas, it was up to 95% on average. 
So that's a huge, huge depletion of populations in just one area. That's obviously not sustainable. The reef fish populations can't keep up with that. They can't reproduce fast enough to keep up with a predator like a lionfish that's consuming so many varieties of prey and also a lot in one sitting. So they are indeed having a lot of negative impacts on our native reef fish here. So a lot of people wonder why lionfish have been so successful. We go out and remove them, but why have they been able to overpopulate so much? Why are they able to just get into all these habitats and overtake all the native reef fish populations? There's a couple main reasons why. Um, there's three main reasons that we focus on that we think have made lionfish so successful. The first thing is their growth patterns. So lionfish in their first um, couple months, couple years in their life, they grow really, really fast. Once they hit a certain length, they kind of start to slow down, but it doesn't take them long to get to those big sizes. And the bigger the lionfish, the more that they can reproduce, the more that they can eat. So anytime we remove lionfish, we track their um, uh, length. So we measure every fish that we catch at our derbies. We measure every fish that we remove for like workshops and stuff like that. Because we want to keep track of what is the average size in certain areas, what are the largest sizes on average, what are the smallest sizes on average, that sort of stuff. So the smallest slime fish ever collected, it's this little guy right here on this person's thumbnail, 24 millimeters long. So just longer than a thumbnail, pretty small. This one over here on the left, that is the largest slime fish ever collected, 489 millimeters, which is over 19 inches long. That's a big lionfish. The max size in their native range is about 320 to 350 millimeters. This one that we caught was well over that max size in their native range. And it's not uncommon to catch one at our derby, or it's not uncommon for teams to catch a lot of fish at our derbies that are over 400 millimeters. So here in their native range, they're getting much bigger on average than they are um, or here in their invasive range, they're getting much bigger on average than they are in their native range. So that might add to their success here. They're getting bigger because maybe they're eating more, they're not getting preyed on really. So then the bigger fish are, like I said, they're able to reproduce more. They're able to eat more once they get to those big sizes. We also try to track, like I said, how long it takes them to get to those big sizes. And we found out that it doesn't take that long. Taking a look at this biggest lionfish, how old do you think that one was? Any guesses? One year? Any other guesses? 10 years? Anything else? Five, somewhere in between there. It was about five years old. So that may seem like quite a few years for a fish, but some fish, you know, and lionfish especially, they could live five to eight years in the wild, maybe longer than that. It's documented under human care, they can live almost up to 30 years. So while that's in pristine conditions and they're being taken care of very well, and that's not necessarily gonna happen all the time in the wild, it's not to say that they can't live much longer than five years. Even if the lionfish were to live eight years um, and it reaches its max size, um, bigger than the native range at five years, that's still three years that it has to reproduce and consume all that prey at such a big size. So how we track growth patterns is a couple different ways. One way is to look at their otoliths. So fish have this like free floating bone in their head cavity called an otolith and they grow a ring on it for every day the fish is alive. I would hate to be the person that counts that, that would suck. <laughs> um, but so you, we can take that out of the fish and estimate how old it is based on that. Or you can do a mark recapture study to estimate how fast it's growing. So you can catch a fish when it's kind of younger, uh, alive in a net, and you can tag it, usually through the tail base, like this one right here. It's the least invasive method. And then come back, recapture that fish a little, like a couple months later, a year later, something like that, and see how much it grew over that time period. And that's where we found out that they were growing really fast in such a short period of time. Lionfish are also, they exhibit high sight fidelity, it's called. So they stay in one place for a very long time, up to seven months sometimes. So it's not hard to go back and find them again once you release them. This is a video example of the mark recapture study. I'll see if it plays. There we go. So you have to go out and net the live lionfish. And 
Flying fish, as I'm sure a lot of you know, they have venomous spines. So you have to be very careful when handling it alive because um, I'm sure the fish is not enjoying this. So it's going to try to get away if possible. So you have gloves for the face that you hold it on. But besides that, it's hard to work with gloves on. So they're going to have to move slowly but also quickly because you don't want to stress the fish out too much. They measure it, take all its data, put the tag through the tail, like I said. It's the least invasive area to do it. And then um, let the fish go, come back sometime later, and do the same thing and remeasure it. So that's how we get a more accurate representation of how fast these fish are growing in a certain time period. I've personally never done this, um, but it does not look the most fun to do, very tedious. Um, does anybody have any questions about marker capture studies or questions so far? No? Yeah, it's pretty cool um, that we're able to do this, but again, it is kind of a tedious method to do this. Yes. For the limefish hunting, you're saying? Yeah, I'm trying to like get all the questions in my head. So you're asking, um, oh, how active are they as hunters? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. So he's asking how active are they of hunters? Do they go after the prey or do they kind of sit and wait for the prey to come to them? Um, they have a couple different ways of hunting. So there's some studies that have been done that showed that uh, fish don't really see lionfish as a threat. They don't look at lionfish as something that they should be scared of. Um, and they don't, they're still kind of figuring out why, I believe. So what they do is they'll kind of put their fins out to look like a, a structure, like a fan maybe for them to hide in. Or basically fish are not scared of them. They'll approach them. So they kind of sit and wait for fish to come to them. And what they do is they have jaws that come out, kind of slingshot out. And they'll either suck, suction the fish in and pull it back. Or they have this other method where they are blowing currents of water towards the fish to make it feel like a current is coming because fish will turn and face whatever current is coming towards them. So the fish are pretty much lining themselves up to be eaten and swallowed very nicely. So they'll approach the fish kind of slowly blowing this water at them and then they'll just suction them in once they get close enough. So they might go a little bit after the fish to suction them in but for the most part they don't really have to go anywhere for the fish to come to them because the Reef fish just haven't been shown to be scared of lionfish. They don't really see them as a predator. That's a great question. Did that answer your question? Good. Yeah. Okay, great. If they learn to avoid them. So there have been some areas, I believe. So he asked uh, if native fish have learned to avoid limefish. Over time, I'm sure they kind of get the hint if they see all their buddies being eaten. Like, oh, that's a predator. Um, but at first, it's not shown that they, you know, they see them as a threat. Over time, they'll probably kind of get the hang of, oh, that is a predator. I'll probably leave this area. Because again, where you find high populations of limefish, you won't find a lot of other reef fish, either because they evacuated the area or they got eaten. So so yeah, over time they do, you know, probably figure out what's going on, but it might take a little bit. Did you have a question? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So she asked, do they hunt in packs? Do they hunt in groups? When she sees them on night dives, she sees them together. Allie might have more information on this, but I know you can find limefish hanging out in the same coral heads together. Um, I don't know if it's due to the fact that they might be using each other to hunt or if it might be like a mating thing. Um, I don't know if you want to interject at all, if you have any...
Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. And so I think if you're doing that, you know, in a group, that could be more effective as well. But that's all I have. Thank you then for the mic. <laughs> yeah. So just to repeat what Ali said and to summarize. So linefish will hang out together in the same areas and group together on the similar coral heads because that's where the prey fish are. They'll go where there's more prey fish. So that's where you'll find them in the same area. They might be using each other to hunt together, to work together. Um, but, you know, besides that, there's not a lot of other information. Besides, yeah. Oh, jeez. Yeah, that's a good question. So she asks, are they causing damage in their native area where they belong? And no, well, one is their numbers are a lot lower there. So they evolved in that region. They're supposed to be there. So it's the same, same thing of having like um, predators here. So we have sharks and stuff here, groupers, eels, that sort of stuff. They evolved to be here. They evolved to be with these other species. So they're not having as much of an effect um, in their native range as they are here where they didn't evolve. The other species here also didn't evolve with them. So they don't really know how to act around them, I guess, per se. So the prey fish don't see them as a predator. Our predators don't see them as prey. They do get preyed on in their native region. I don't know how often that occurs, um, but again, their numbers are lower in the Indo-Pacific and biodiversity in the Indo-Pacific is a lot higher too. There's more competition, more species in general. Did you have a question? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, so she makes a great point. Uh, she said that, you know, in Bonaire, people were saying that they do have native predators in their native region, so eels and things like that, maybe sharks. Um, and then they were saying, you know, they try to teach the native predators here to eat the invasive lionfish, which we actually are going to hit on just after this. So not to get ahead of myself, but we'll talk about the native predators here and how they interact with lionfish and how we should interact in that situation as well, too. So if you hold tight for just a second, we'll get to those slides. But to jump back into this, and again, we'll have time at the end for questions, too. So another reason why they're so successful is their reproduction. So they reproduce a lot. Lionfish start to reproduce pretty early on, less than a year, some of them can start reproducing. They only need another fish to spawn. So compare that to like a NASA grouper, they take five to seven some years to sexually mature to even reproduce. And then they reproduce only once a year in huge aggregations. They won't reproduce unless they're all together with hundreds and thousands of fish. Lionfish only need one other partner to spawn, and they'll do that all year round. The females can lay two buoyant egg masses every two to four days, and she lays about 30 to 50,000 eggs every time she does that. So on average, we think that it's two million eggs per year a female might lay. That is a lot of eggs. Now, again, a lot of the eggs may not survive. It's a low percentage, just like all fish that reproduce this way, but they're reproducing a lot more than other species might be doing. So they have very, very high reproduction rates. So that's probably another reason why they become so su successful. And like I said, their egg masses are buoyant. Once they're laid, they float to the surface and float along with the currents. And that's how they're able to spread throughout the different areas in the tropical Western Atlantic. Yeah, they're, they are like aliens, yeah. The last reason why they're probably so successful is what they're infamous for, and that is their venom. So lionfish have 18 venomous spines on their body. Um, different from poison, it often gets interchanged, poison and venom does, but it is different. Does anyone know the difference between venom and poison? Anybody? Yes. Perfect. She said, venom is ingested or injected while poison is ingested. And that is exactly right. So think of like a poison dart frog or a rat poison, maybe. Something has to eat those things to feel the effect. Venom, like a snake's fang, has to be injected. Something has to bite you or sting you like a bee, maybe, too, to get that venom inside of you into your bloodstream. So lionfish are venomous. 
their meat is completely fine to eat. And we want to promote that because that's one of the reasons why we've been so successful at removing lionfish is you can eat them and they are actually very tasty to eat. So they're not poisonous. They are safe to eat. The only thing you have to worry about is their 18 venomous spines, which you can see here. They have 13 dorsal spines, which are really obvious. They stick straight out at you and they're pretty hard to miss. The ones that people do miss are the ones underneath. So they have one on each of their pelvic fins and then they have three on their anal spines. So that's a lot of times where people um, don't realize that they have spines under there. They cut like the top ones off and then I'll see them cut the pectoral fins off. The pectoral fins, the tail fin and the back of the um, dorsal and anal fin, those are safe to touch. It's just the um, ones in front on the bottom and then the 13 on top that you have to worry about. People will cut off all of the fins except for the ones underneath and they don't really realize that there's venomous spines on those too. So the venom is a protein-based neurotoxin and it's actually on the outside of the spine. It's not inside like a snake's fang. So the venom is held in there by these sheaths of skin on all the spines. And you can kind of see there's a groove running down the length of the spine on all sides of it. So the venom sits in those grooves. The sheath of skin holds it in there. As soon as the spine punctures something, that skin is pushed back because it's too thin to puncture whatever it's going through. And then the venom is released that way. So because of the venom, that makes it kind of hard to consume. It's kind of like, you know, a plate of cookies versus a plate of fish guts. Which one would you rather eat? Technically, you can eat both of them, but there's one that's a lot better, and it's probably the cookies. So predators look at that, and they think, oh, I don't really want to eat something that's venomous when I can get something much easier to eat um, that's not venomous. But that's not to say that they don't get consumed. Like we talked about in their native range, they do get eaten. And here in their invasive range, predators have been shown to eat lionfish, whether that be on their own or because people are, you know, like trying to train them to do so. So what do you guys think about training native predators to eat lionfish? Do you think it's a good thing, bad thing? You don't know? Thoughts? You're the one who mentioned it. So what do you think? Do you think that it's like would help or what do you think? Yeah, okay, so she said why not? It could help things. Did you have something? So that's one too. She mentioned they might get lazy and then they just wait for you to hunt for them. Claude? Perfect. So while it's a great idea and thought, it had good intentions behind it, it's kind of bounced back on some people. So they're starting to associate divers and humans as a food source rather than lionfish as prey. Because again, they're not hunting them on their own. They're not going and seeking them out. They're just kind of waiting for you to hand feed them, whether it be just opening up the zookeeper and dumping it straight into their mouth or just handing it to them on the spear. So basically, that's a pretty easy meal for them if they don't have to do any of the work but follow us around. In certain areas, um, predators have gotten quite aggressive towards divers, not necessarily because they're trying to be that aggressive, but they just really want to get that food. Um, it's even to the point where sometimes they attack divers because they think they have lionfish. So this is a case where a moray eel swam up and bit this diver's hand because she was carrying lionfish collecting equipment. Eels don't have the best eyesight, but they do have really good smell. So probably smelled lionfish on her, whether she had them or not, I don't know. But um, it bit her hand. Again, they don't have great eyesight. So if they smell prey, they're probably going to try to find it. And since they don't have hands, they try to bite whatever they think is the prey. So it doesn't always end well for the divers. Um, you know, people get close encounters all the time with wildlife, and sometimes it ends like this. So that's not what we want because then that creates more of a fear of the native reef predators. If you're an avid diver, you know that sharks, eels, groupers, they're really cool things to see underwater. A lot of times they're really curious. They might want to know what's going on. They might want to look at your camera, that sort of stuff. And they're not really a threat while you're underwater. They're just kind of there hanging out. And again, some people seek them out. Some people want to see sharks on their dive. But to a new diver who's getting into it, and they hear all these stories on the news of people getting attacked and bitten by sharks and stuff. That's not really a good look for the native predators. We don't want people to be more scared of them than they already are. It's also not always probably great for the animals too. While this eel um, 
you know, probably survived. Lionfish venom hasn't killed anybody or anything that we know of. But that's probably uncomfortable. It might impede them hunting for a couple of days afterwards. You know, I'm sure the venom doesn't feel good. You don't want spines sticking through your face. Sometimes you'll see, like, um, in this picture, you'll see them kind of sticking out, getting stuck in their throat, because if they eat them sideways off the spear or something, it might get stuck, all the spines. So it might just be uncomfortable for the animals. And then again, we're kind of doing them an in-service by teaching them that we'll just hunt for them rather than doing their natural way of life. So while it was a good idea in theory, it's kind of backfired in a lot of places. So that's not to say that they're not doing it on their own, though. They are starting to learn. So in the Cayman Islands, Allie Candelmo, she was doing some research tagging lionfish, trying to track their movement on the reefs. So this is a live lionfish. She's putting a tag in to track them later. Cuts them open, puts the tag in, sews them up, lets them go. Then they're finding that the lionfish moves around a little bit, not too much, and then all of a sudden it moves all the way down the island and all the way back in a really short amount of time. As I said earlier, lionfish don't really like to move around. They kind of stay in the same spot for months at a time. And if they do move, it's usually not all the way up and down an island. They're just not swimmers like that. So that tells us that the lionfish probably got ate by something. Um, they didn't really know what at first, something bigger, maybe a shark or a grouper of some sort that moves around a lot um, and then you know, probably got pooped out at the end and then the tag stopped. So it uh, got eaten, swam around, and that's what they were tracking was the predator, not the lionfish. They found that there were indeed a couple locals that really liked the lionfish, including these nurse sharks. Uh, there's one nurse shark in particular, I think they named Herb, that was relentless at trying to get these lionfish right after they released them. You can see this person holding him back with a net. Uh, so they thought, well, what if after we tag the lionfish, you know, at night or closer to the evening, we just put them in a container overnight and then the, in the morning we'll release them so they're well enough to protect themselves and get away. Maybe they were stunned right away so they couldn't defend themselves. So they put them in this holding container overnight and Herb decided to just go and visit this holding container and just sit and smell the lionfish and wait for them to be released. So this is evidence that, you know, they are hunting them on their own. They do want to eat them. And there are other predators out there that are eating them. And it wasn't just right after the lionfish were being tagged that they were being consumed. It was days, months, weeks after that they were being consumed that they got tagged. So you can see here 55 days, 88 days, 143 days, even 165 days after they got tagged, they were consumed. So that's pretty crazy. That shows us right there that they are, in fact, eating them but it's not happening to the extent that it's gonna solve the invasion. Enough predators are not going out there and consuming lionfish on a daily basis to make a huge impact in the population. But that's not to say that they're not important. They are helping us, they are aiding in it naturally. Um, we don't wanna train them to do it. You wouldn't try to train like a grizzly bear to control your backyard squirrels. So, you know, you probably shouldn't try to train a shark to control lionfish. But if they're doing that on their own, that's great. So we want to protect the native predators, but we also need to go out and remove them on our own. So that leaves people as the best control to the lionfish invasion. There are a lot of different ways that people can get involved to help with the lionfish invasion, whether that be just educating other people on it or actually going out and remo removing them yourselves. So there's a lot of different removal met methods for lionfish. Some people have caught them on a hook and line before. It is pretty uncommon. So I wouldn't go out with a fishing line and bet that you're going to find a lionfish on it um, because the chances of that happening are pretty, pretty slim. Uh, there's a lot of trap research being done to remove lionfish because that's you know a lot easier to put a trap out than setting divers out every single day to go out and um, spear them. So Reef is partnering with FW FWC right now to design different traps and put them out and see um, how well they're working basically, if it's an effective method. How this started I believe is because lobster fishermen were catching a lot of lionfish in their traps. 
So some talks started from there thinking, well, maybe limefish, we can attract them to these traps and get them to come to them. And then we don't have to send people underwater or we can put them in areas where people aren't diving, like really deep areas. This is the Giddings trap that we're using. It's basically a big circular net uh, with some uh, metal bars on the outside and then like a fencing in the middle. So limefish are attracted to the structure and then you just pull this uh, net up from the bottom and hopefully catch a lot of limefish. If you guys wanna learn more about the trap research that we're doing right now, um, and you're coming to our open house tonight or the social tonight, um, Dr. Ali Kendemo can sure talk to you more about that. She's heavily involved with that trap research. So it's pretty interesting stuff. Besides all the traps and things like that, a really great way to remove them is doing regular removals using spears or hand nets. So that has been the most effective method at removing large numbers of lionfish in certain areas and reducing populations in certain areas. So this is a net example, and this is a pole spear example. We'll kind of talk about both, but regular removal is key. It's like weeding a garden. The more often you do it, the better your garden's gonna be. You're probably always gonna have weeds, but if you wait to do it once a year, half of your plants will probably be dead and your garden will be overtaken. You can't get to all the weeds by then. But if you do it constantly, it's way better off. Yes. Oh. A question from online. What can be done about limefish far below recreational diving depth? So that would be like the trap research, um, putting different traps down there. I know there was talks of using like a robot that recognized limefish and speared them, I think. Um, or there's traps that use limefish fac facial recognition. So there's a lot of different um, things like that that are being done. Um, but yeah, again, limefish can go down to 900 feet, 1,000 feet. So using things like um, traps or I know a lot of people have started using rebreathers, not to go down to 1,000 feet, but to go down deeper beyond recreational limits um, to spear limefish. Uh, so yeah, that's a great question. Um, so netting is one way that you can get limefish. Uh, usually we use like aquarium nets, just big aquarium nets and scoop the limefish up and bring it back to the boat right away. You can carry with you a big like underwater dry bag and put the limefish in there, but then you have to haul those live limefish around. Sometimes we'll net live limefish to keep as um, education fish to show like kids and stuff. So this is an example of someone just free diving down to hand net limefish using those kind of like aquarium nets, I guess. So she goes from the front and the back of the fish, not the sides. So it's that way the fish doesn't get away, of course, and then just scoops it up. You really have to commit. If you're gonna net them, don't hesitate because the fish will just get out. But once it's in there, especially if you're using kind of an aquarium mesh net and not like a dry bag type net, the fins kind of get stuck in there. So that helps too. And then you just bring them back to the boat. If you're close by, bring them back to the dock or the shore, wherever you're at. Netting is useful in areas that spearing, spearing is not allowed. So you can spear linefish wherever you can spear other fish. Wherever you can hook and line using a fishing, fishing pole, you can net linefish. So that would be an instance where you might want to net some linefish is if you're in an area where you can't, um, you're not allowed to spear. Spearing is definitely one of the most effective methods to remove a lot of fish at once. It's pretty easy. All you need is a pole spear. So it's just this long stick with a band on the end and then prongs on the other end of it. You pull the band to the top of the spear and when you release, the spear shoots forward with the momentum and then spears the fish. So it's not like a spear gun by any means. It's a lot more simple than that. You can get different sizes depending on your preference. Um, and then you carry with you a what's called a zookeeper or a containment device. I think I put a picture on here a little bit later of a containment device. So that way you can carry them with you on your dive and you don't have to go back to the boat every time. So this is an example of spearing. We suggest that if you want to go out and spear linefish, that you're more of an advanced diver. So when we hold workshops, we require that you have at least 30 log dives in an advanced open water because it's a lot to kind of keep track of. You have to make sure you have good buoyancy, good control of your breathing. A lot of times we're going deeper beyond um, open water limits. So you definitely need an advanced certification for that. Um, and your adrenaline really gets going. So you use your air faster. So we want to make sure that you 
have more um, dives under your belt, have more experience before you go and spear lionfish. So the lionfish is right here in the middle. This diver does a really good job at keeping calm, good buoyancy, approaches the fish nice and slow. The only thing that we recommend is, um, you know, it's kind of not as terrible because there's not a lot of live coral right here, but try to watch where the fish is at and, you know, don't slam the fish into like live coral or something, or don't spear another fish behind it, that sort of stuff. We don't want to damage our native environment any more than it is. So we want to try to respect the coral, the other species there. Um, again, this is mostly rock and that kind of helps get a better um, grip on the fish, I guess, if you can kind of have a backing to it. But just try to get a good angle on the fish before you spear it. They don't look at us as like a predator really in areas that they're heavily removed, maybe a little bit, but they're pretty easy to approach slowly. Um, you don't have to rush by any means. They're not gonna go anywhere. They're not gonna swim away. They might go a little bit into a hole if you get you know, like kind of like rush up on them. So take your time, go slow, um, focus on your breathing, your buoyancy. Don't rush basically. This is another example of spearing. So you can have a zookeeper that you buy or some people make makeshift containers. Um, so this is a bucket that they just put a funnel on top of it, spear the lionfish, put it right in there, and then the funnel catches the fish. So again, the fish kind of just sit. They don't really go anywhere. They don't move. They're not really scared of us approaching them as long as you do it calmly. This one, the first part of the video is kind of sped up, but this is an example that these are really hardy fish, and when you spear them, they don't always die right away. So when you spear them, a lot of times they move around like this fish. You can see it really um, flitting about. It's not sitting still. So this would be a case where taking your time is kind of necessary, because if you speared that fish and brought it up right away, it probably would have tried anything in its power to get off of that spear and then swim away. If you spear a fish a couple times and miss, it'll dart into a hole and no one will ever be able to spear that fish. So you want to, again, take your time. Um, if the fish starts freaking out and moving, just hesitate for a second. If you need to call your dive buddy over to help you, we always suggest diving with someone else who has a spear too in case maybe you don't hit the fish very good and you need someone else to come um, for backup to help you. So always dive with a buddy, of course, but it's really helpful for spearing to dive with a buddy as well. So this is the containment device. Zookeeper are the ones that are sold really often that people use. They're just these long plastic tubes, basically with a funnel on top, or people make them out of buckets or water jugs, that sort of stuff. Basically any kind of hard plastic container that you can put the lionfish in that they'll fit in and the spines won't come through. Um, and then something that's easy to carry underwater. Be careful with these water jugs because I heard they're really buoyant. Um, Mike Goldberg from Key Dives was spearing lionfish one time. Um, for anyone who's going out with Key Dives, I'm sure you guys will meet him. He had one of these water jug containers and he set it down to spear a lionfish and he turned around and it was gone. It had probably floated away somewhere and nobody saw it float away. So um, just be careful with that. Uh, you can clip it to you or have your buddy hold it as well, too. So if you do go out and... Has anyone um, speared lionfish before? Raise your hands. One, two. Allie has. Tom has. Wow, I had no idea. So if you do go out and collect lionfish, of course, they do have venomous spines, but hopefully now you know where the spines are located so you can be careful not to touch those areas. But if you do end up getting stung, um, a couple things. So first, the most common symptom if you get stung is a lot of swelling and pain. If you want to hear about lionfish stings, I'm sure Allie has a lot of great stories for you. Um, I personally have not gotten stung, knock on wood. I'm kind of waiting for it to happen since you guys know I'm a little accident prone. Um, but lots of swelling, lots of pain. If you're wearing any jewelry or bracelets or watches, or if you get stung underwater and you're wearing a wetsuit, like let's say you get stung in your hand, we suggest taking all of that off as fast as possible because you don't want to have more problems on top of the lionfish thing. You don't want to um, restrict any blood flow to those areas and um, have to get like a ring cut off or your wetsuit cut off, that sort of stuff. If you get stung, the first thing you want to do is get something hot on it. Do not put ice or cold on it. Um, since it is a protein-based neurotoxin, cold will just preserve the venom. 
the symptoms of the pain and the swelling might go away, but it'll come right back as soon as you take that cold off. If you put heat on it, it'll start to denature the venom and get rid of the venom and the symptoms and the pain. Um, you want it pretty hot. You don't want to burn yourself because, again, you don't want another problem on top of the limefish thing. But you do want it pretty hot. Um, you want to squeeze out the area that you got stung, try to get the blood out to reduce the swelling, that sort of stuff. And, again, just take off anything that might restrict the blood flow to that area. We suggest to seek you know, treatment if you need to, go to the hospital if you need to, just to get it checked out, just to be safe. But again, no one's ever died from a limefish sting. Everyone's going to react differently to it, though, like a bee sting. Some people might have pretty minor symptoms. Some people might have more extreme symptoms. Um, but just take the necessary precautions when you're handling limefish to avoid getting stung in the first place. Know where the spines are. Be aware of them. Don't try to rush handling them or flying them, anything like that. All right. So... We've learned that limefish are a big problem in the tropical Western Atlantic. They're having a lot of negative impacts, but we can do something about it. We can go out and remove them, whether it be hand nets, traps, uh, spearing. But the biggest thing is trying to get as many people out there as possible on a regular basis to go out and do it. So one way that you guys can help is participate in our limefish derbies. Reef started holding limefish derbies quite a few years ago, and now a lot of different organizations are doing it. Dive shops are doing it. FWC has derbies going and competitions going all the time. So if you're you know, living in an area where they're invasive, check and see if there's any derbies or removal events in your area or come down to the Florida Keys and participate in one of the reef derbies. Derbies are really fun because not only is it getting a lot of people together to go out and dive together um, in the name of conservation, but they're also removing a ton of limefish in one sitting, uh, thousands of limefish. Up in Destin, Florida, they hold a huge competition every year to remove limefish. It's like the biggest derby. And they removed like, oh, I don't remember the number this year, like 10,000 limefish, something like that. Um, so they remove a lot of limefish in just a couple of days. Our derbies remove 1,000, 2,000 limefish, um, especially the Upper Keys Derby here in um, uh, Amarada. Derbies also are like a huge event. People come out and learn about limefish. We have dissections, we have fillet demos, limefish tastings, we have educational booths, games, live music, all sorts of stuff. So we want to make it a fun event for everyone so people can come out and learn stuff even if they're not going out and removing limefish on their own. So you can participate in a derby, go out in a team and remove them, and you get cash prizes for the limefish you removed. Uh, we give prizes for largest limefish, smallest limefish, and most limefish caught in first, second, and third place. So you can make money off of them. Um, derbies have been shown to reduce uh, limefish population numbers in the areas where they're held regularly. Sometimes up to 50% of the population is reduced because of these derbies. So regular mass removal events do help. And if you participate in one, you're helping the overall population of uh, the limefish. You can also check out what local charters have limefish removals on them. So here in the Keys, it's become really popular to include limefish dives on their regular charters. So um, Forever Young, uh, Key Dives, and Amarada Dive Center do regular limefish removals on their dives. So if you're just a recreational diver and you want to go out not for a competition but just on your own, you can do that. You can try and see if any of the charters will let you go do that. Um, a lot of places in South Florida are starting to do it, too, in Miami, Fort Lauderdale. So if you're anywhere in the area where they're found, um, where they're found invasively, you can see if any of the dive shops will take you out and go to do it recreationally. You can also start to do it commercially. It's become a big commercial fish, so people are starting to sell it, or they have been selling it in restaurants and grocery stores. People will go out and just get hundreds and thousands of fish to sell. A lot of the teams that come to our derbies sell their fish to restaurants or wholesalers, so you can make a profit off of the lionfish. Like I said before, they're really good to eat. So that's one of the things that we try to heavily promote with removing them. Don't waste them. They are good to eat. You can make money off of them. Reef has a cookbook. Lots of chefs are starting to make cookbooks with lionfish incorporated dishes. Has anyone ever eaten lionfish here? Oh, okay, quite a few people. If you don't like fish, I hear a lot of people that don't really like the taste of fish like lionfish. It's a nice white fish. Yes. 
So she has, uh, around here, is there a restaurant that you can go and taste it? I know Chef Michael's has um, linefish on their menu regularly. Honk House tries to have it regularly on their menu, um, but that's kind of, it depends on how much they have and when they get it. So yeah, no problem. Um, a lot of the restaurants around here have started Cook Your Catch, so they don't have to supply it on a regular basis, but if you get it somehow from a grocery store or you remove it yourself or your friend gives it to you, you can bring the flays or the lime fish to the restaurant and they'll cook it for you. So that's another cool thing that they've started um, to try and get people to eat it as well. So they are really good to eat. You know, you can make tacos, ceviche, lime fish dip. Um, I like coconut fried lime fish. That's my favorite with like mango salsa. It's super, Stacy's giving a thumbs up back there. It's really good. So if you haven't tried lime fish, try to get a hold of it and try some. It's really good. And you're helping the environment by eating it too. To help them not go to waste even more, you can also make jewelry out of lime fish. And it's actually really pretty. I wish I would have worn my necklace today. Um, this started in Belize. Fishermen's wives were cutting off the fins to make a little extra money to make jewelry off of, and it just kind of took off from there. So Reef holds linefish jewelry workshops, both virtually and in person. We also sell linefish jewelry making kits where you can buy it and we'll ship it to your house and you can do it at home. If you're not somebody who has a lot of patience, you know, maybe just buy the jewelry, don't make it. I personally don't have a lot of patience, so I just like to buy it from other people or have, you know, somebody else make it for me. But it is really fun to do at least once. A uh, lot of people around here are starting to do it like as a business. Um, artists and jewelry makers are incorporating lionfish into their regular jewelry sales. So it's really cool to see. Again, these fish, even though they are invasive here, it's not their fault that they're here, right? We release them. They are really cool fish. They have a lot of really great adaptations and they don't know that they're this big of a problem. So we don't wanna waste them. We want to respect them. We wanna use them any way as possible. And if we can use them, we should. So if you ever remove limefish, try to use it in some way. If you don't use it, somebody will. Reef will always take limefish to use for education. So we do dissections with school groups or we send them to schools to dissect in their classrooms elsewhere. So they will always be put to use by somebody. So we want to encourage not to waste them. Yes. Yeah, so she asked, do, you know, what happens with the venom in the jewelry? So the venom, um, the actual venomous spines, you can either bake or boil to, get rid of the venom, um, or uh, you can just use the regular fins. So like these are probably the tail fin or the like the non-venomous dorsal fins. So you can just cut those off and dry them. We just set them out in the sun on like concrete or wood panels. The sun dries them out. Um, they have like a little bit of a fishy smell, but it's not, it's not terrible. <laughs> Um, I would definitely put them in a sealed container if you plan on doing it yourself. But once you put them into the jewelry, it's covered with, um, I forget what it's called, the acrylic um, glue, whatever it is. So you can't smell it when it's on you. People are always concerned about that. Like, will I smell like fish if I wear this jewelry? No, you won't. So you can use the venomous spines or a lot of people just use the non-venomous fins or like the pectoral fins, but for the spines, boiling them helps, it'll get rid of the venom um, or baking them, that sort of stuff. So that's a great question. If you are interested in participating in more lionfish um, workshops or removal events, you wanna come to a derby, you wanna participate in a derby, or you wanna know what's going on with lionfish research, like if you wanna keep up with our trap research, you can follow our Reef Invasive Lionfish Facebook page. It's separate from the regular Reef, reef page because we post so much on it. Um, we made a separate page for it. Also, it's just easier to put all of the lionfish events on there. So I highly suggest checking out the Facebook page to stay up to date on all things lionfish and invasive species, if you guys are interested in that. Besides that, that is the end of the presentation. Does anybody have any questions? Yes. Yeah, so she asked if we can catch some of the fishing pole. While it has been done, I wouldn't bet on that happening if you took it out. Um, the chances of you catching it on a fishing line are pretty slim. Yes. Are there any 
studies being done. Oh, <laughs> Daryl's on it. Right. Are there any studies being done um, by the science community to find um, uses for their neurotoxins, like cures, or you know, it's not going to cure cancer, but you know, maybe some kind of cancer. Who, who knows? Allie, do you know? Did everybody hear that? Basically, no. <laughs> That's a great question. She has a question back there. A predator of their eggs. Um, there are fish that eat eggs generally. Um, so I'm sure there is. I don't know if there's any specific predators that eat eggs of limefish. bad taste to it. It's not toxic, but it actually tastes bad, so it deters um, egg predation. Um, they hatch pretty quickly within 24 hours, so it's not like at a spawning aggregation site where you'll see a bunch of egg predators coming in. You know, there's just two little blobs that randomly coming through the water that would likely not be seen anyway, so they're more likely to get consumed as larvae by any any pre any larval predator um, for sure are eating them. You know, it's just like any other fish. They're gonna they're, only a few are gonna make it, but there's just so many going out there that you get enough. Any other questions? Yes, Curtis. So normally, fish abundance data from the reef survey project is not distributed to the public with both abundance and the location of the dive sites, because it makes it too easy for fishermen to just go fish out all of our favorite diving reefs. Is there any utility in the lionfish data to the general community? Like if the general community knew, hey, there's a huge abundance right now of lionfish in this particular spot. Can you support that? So basically you're asking, is there a way to access specific areas to remove large numbers of lionfish? Oh, providing that data. Yeah. Um, did you want to answer that? You know, again, through apps and FWC had, Reef had apps. Um, problem is that people don't want to share their <laughs> sites of large populations of lionfish because they go to them and catch them either to sell them commercially. So it, it really hasn't been successful. We had a sightings program for years, which is still active, where we got reports of lionfish and that went through the USGS uh, database. And so we recorded the kind of movement of lionfish, but creating a um, source of good areas to go, it's, it's very local specific. You can get some of that information from some, from some locals, but most people aren't willing to share that data. Um, we, there is a new app called Lionfish Patrol that's kind of encouraging the share of catch. Um, so you can kind of compete with each other on catch and get rough estimates, but it wouldn't be like, go to this site. You know, we struggle even with our derbies with new teams. They are always constantly asking me where they should go. And I just give them rough ideas of what's, what type of sites are good. But, you know, it, you really have to get out there and know the location to find them. Yeah, uh, so we do get the lionfish data through the Volunteer Fish Survey Project, um, and that's accessible to anyone to look at. Um, unfortunately, well, unfortunately, fortunately, most of the recreational dive sites don't actually have a lot of lionfish on them. So if you're a lionfish hunter, um, the sites that most people go to frequently as divers actually are limited in lionfish because they were speared regularly in the beginning. They've been kind of cut down. They're shallower, you know, easier sites a lot in most of the areas, a high number of lionfish are in deep sites on the edge of the reef, you know, or sites that divers aren't at, and so they've kind of thrived there. 
Yeah, it's a great idea. We <laughs> tried it in Little Cayman. We tracked it in Little Cayman. We've tried, you know, talked about it in Florida, talked about it in other areas, but like fishers don't want to share their sites, you know. So once someone knows of good source population, I mean, if you go to the uh, Gulf of Mexico, like people aren't willing to share their like pot, you know, they because they've got artificial reefs out there. And like some people, only certain people know where some of the artificial reefs are. So, and that's because it's not just lionfish. They're going for groupers and stuff as well there. So. Somebody told me that they read a report that a nurse shark was eating live lionfish. Are there any reports of any uh, predators who actually consume live lionfish? Yeah, so uh, sharks, eels, groupers, barracudas, like large reef predators will consume lionfish on their own. People will try to feed them lionfish. And we want to discourage against people trying to you know, train them to hunt lionfish because, as Claude said earlier, that just basically associates divers as a food source and not really lionfish as prey. So they are going out and eating them on their own, but it's it's not happening like all the time. And we want to discourage people from feeding them the fish. So, yeah. I have one more question. In the area where lionfish are native, like in Indonesia and the Indo-Pacific, something must be eating maybe their larvae because they're not out of, the population is not out of control like it is here. Is there any news about what is can you, keeping them under control there? Yeah, so they are getting preyed on in their native region by similar predators. Uh, their numbers are a lot lower generally there. Their, the biodiversity in the Indo-Pacific is also a lot higher. The uh, animals there evolved to have lionfish in that region, so it kind of balances each other out. I know lionfish have been removed from there for the aquarium trade. Um, I don't know, Al, if you have more information on like lionfish in their native range. But. It's just a balance that's already, you know, it, it's interesting because we were just diving in Indo Indonesia and it was the first time I had been there in 10 years. And I was like, we went to a few sites in the beginning that weren't like in the national, they weren't in the park and they weren't quite as nice. And there was a lot of red lionfish there, like more than I had remembered seeing when I was there. And so I think because there was no other fish there, it was overfished. The habitat was a bit low. The lionfish kind of thrived on those couple sites. But in the rest of the Indo-Pacific, you know, where there's a lot of habitat, a lot of other fish for them to compete with and the predators there to still keep them in check as their juveniles. I don't think there's anything actively eating them regularly as adults, but when they're juveniles, when they first settle, um, they, they're just as much of a threat as other small um, juveniles. Yeah, I think you had a question, right? Uh, so I don't know if, if all the counties are different, but oh, <laughs> do you know, I know there's like a, if you were gonna take your couch and sell it to a restaurant or, um, or a seafood house, you'd only need like the $50 license. You don't need a commercial fisherman's license. You have to have some license. Or do you know what that is? To, to sell your line. To sell line fish. You need a, I forget the actual, sorry, Ali, I forget. To sell line fish, what do you need again? It is harvest? called a commercial fishing license, but it's it's not like the 300. It's not so you can then sell it to other people um, yet. So it's it's seventy five dollars, I think now the F, just the normal FWC one. So you can sell it to any um, wholesaler, any buyer, any restaurant. Uh, but yes, you do need that. You don't need a fishing permit to catch lionfish, but you do need it to sell it. That's through FWC. You can do it online. You get it in the day, and you get it right away online, and then you can sell it to any normal buyer. I promise my last question. <laughs> That's okay. Um, I can't remember where I was diving, but uh, the dive guide was telling us that juvenile lionfish, um, their spines are do not have the neurotoxin venom in them, so you can hold them and touch them, and, and we were putting them in our hands. Is that just lucky, or is that a real thing? <laughs> I mean, I didn't get <laughs> hurt, but... <laughs> they have the venom, right, but it, their spines are just too... Yeah, they have enough. the venom, but they're the spines are soft. I, I had a 
bet with an intern when <laughs> Lionfish first uh, kind of were in Turks and Caicos and we tried to get stung by a little juvenile too and they kind of bend. Um, they just don't puncture the skin. Okay. But I wouldn't do it. Not, <laughs> I wouldn't hold it in my hand. <laughs> And, and w when they're juveniles, the venom is often closer to the tip. So you're actually more likely to get envenomated if it does break the skin than you are with like the bigger lionfish. You often, well, if you handle them a lot, often you can get nicked and actually bleed, but you don't get envenomated because it hasn't actually like created that trigger and pushed the venom in. Whereas when they're smaller, the spines are smaller, the, the venom will be closer to the tip. So you're more likely to get a little venom in there. I don't need to experiment. <laughs> but the bigger ones hurt more because they got more venom to deliver. Any other questions? This has been great. Very interactive audience. Nope. All right. Well, if you guys think of more questions later, uh, you should come to the uh, Reef Campus tonight at 5. 5 p.m. from 5 to 7, we'll be having a, um, got one hour, we'll be having an open house gathering at the Reef Campus, mile marker 98 in the median, so you can access it from both sides of the highway, very convenient. Well, you can park in the grass or at some other parking lot across the street. Um, but come to the Reef Campus, socialize with other Reef members, other fish geeks, other people who love the ocean, diving, conservation, and you can meet all of the staff and interns on the board there, or most of the board is here. If you have any more lionfish questions later, uh, you can ask us then. Um, but yeah, it's been a great crowd. Thank you guys for being such an interactive audience, and I hope you guys learned something cool about lionfish today. Thank you.